Morning, everybody. We're just giving people opportunity to join the meeting. We will start in a few minutes' time. See you just now. Thank you. Good morning, all the colleagues. Uh, welcome here this morning, the cold morning. Um, uh, fortunately, and hopefully, you can sit uh, in a joining from, from a heater or something. Um, quite cold here in Johannesburg as well, and Pretoria, and so on. Um, we are busy allowing people into the meeting. While we're doing that, let's. Uh, uh, ask you to keep yourselves on mute, um, otherwise we've got too many background noises. Um, and uh, let me do some housekeeping uh, while we still allowing more people into the meeting. Uh, we have uh, load shedding on our side here. Uh, we, I'm sitting at the moment, so I'm on the inverter myself. So all the best to all, all of you being on, on load shedding. All right, so in terms of, we obviously on the Zoom platform, it's great being on Zoom. Uh, we make use of the meeting uh, platform for Zoom. In other words, you will be able to unmute yourself when you want to ask a question during the panel discussion. Um, and uh, that's why we don't make use of the webinar function. The webinar function, you cannot unmute yourself and share your video and stuff like that. So we prefer, you know, making it a, a community where we can talk to each other. Um, so please, Keep your questions to the panel discussions. Uh, we have two of them. And uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, we can do that in a more orderly manner. So you can use the, the chat room to the bottom of your screen to greet each other. And uh, please know, do not do promotional work in the chat room. We try to keep the focus on the topic of the day. 
Um, but you're welcome to greet each other, share contact details, network. You're very much welcome to do it in the chat room. You can also, um, you know, post questions for the panelists in the chat room. Um, and we will try and address those questions when we do the panel discussions. And then, um, yeah, you can put your phone on mute. It usually rings just when you want to speak. Um, and uh, should something go wrong, please keep an eye on your inbox. We, we um, you know, share uh, the, the link to, to rejoin the session again through uh, email, should something go wrong. Uh, fortune hasn't happened before, but okay. Um, I also encourage the guys following on YouTube. You're welcome to post questions for the panelists on YouTube. You can text your questions and we will see whether we can address those questions. Um, ladies and gents, important also is that, uh, you know, that this, this event is for free and all related content on the web is for free. So uh, we obviously have uh, valued sponsors and alliances that uh, make this possible for us. And we in, in, in a really in appreciation uh, of that. So I want to share my screen just to get the program up for us. Just bear with me for a moment. And there we go. Uh, we're talking today about improving public transport, international best practices. And it's the 3rd of June, 2021. Uh, Professor Jackie Walters uh, is our host today from the University of Johannesburg. Prof. Walters has been a mentor to myself for many years, since actually the start of this forum 14 years ago. Uh, so Jackie will uh, do the official welcome just now. What I would like to do is to just give recognition to all our sponsors. So. Prof. Walters will tell you more about our host, University of Johannesburg, just now. Um, we are proud having uh, official alliances, industry alliances with us. Um, this started happening in the beginning of this year. We've got the South African Association of Freight Forwarders. We've got South African Express Parcel Association. We've got South African Bus Operators Association. We've got Africa Rail Industry Association and the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Um, so we're very proud in having them as formal industry alliances to the Toronto Forum, also contributing quite a lot to the content and uh, what's happening here at the Transport Forum. Um, yeah, so uh, SAF and SAF Saipa, that's not related today for this event, but maybe uh, Basil, do you wanna quickly tell us a little bit more about Saboa? Okay, it seems to me Basil is not there at the moment, but he can. Hello, Harry. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah. are, are you not getting? Are you not getting enough of me later on today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, morning, everybody. Sabawa is the uh, industry representative body representing the bus and coach operations uh, nationally, with a with a slight uh, interest over the borders, but broadly representing all sectors of the public transport, bus and coach sector. Uh, actively involved in talking to policy policy decisions, engagements at all levels uh, between all our stakeholders. We've got about 400 uh, old principal members made up of operators uh, and uh, bus owners and operators and around 60 odd associate members who are essentially partners and uh, service providers to the industry. Uh, we're proud to be aligned with Harry and his team at the Transport Forum. And it's a big year for us. We're tabling quite a lot of issues in the public transport space. So looking forward to today as well. Thanks, Harry. Thank you so much, Basil. Really appreciate your support. Ladies and gents, yes. Then we've got, uh, um, we've got uh, media alliances, uh, also many years with the Transport Forum, Freight News and Railways Africa. Um, should you not be a subscriber, it will be definitely worth your while to subscribe to these uh, uh, magazines. Um, 
giving lots of uh, exposure to the Toronto Forum. Obviously, there are others as well, like Kramer Media, Engineering News, and so on. We really appreciate their support. University of Johannesburg have been a gold sponsor since the start of the Transport Forum. Prof. Jackie Walters will tell us more about them just now. Then Huawei, uh, and it's great news. So Huawei is actually going to, to do a sort of a lucky winners today, uh, and they're going to give us six gifts for lucky participants. And these draws will be done, um, you know, during the panel discussions at the start of each panel discussion. So it's encouragement for you as well to stay on board. But I would like to give Tommy opportunity to quickly tell us more about the gold sponsor, Huawei. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, I think uh, later on uh, after, in the afternoon, I can tell a little bit more about Huawei. But Huawei is a technology company, a global company, and uh, our focus uh, is in various industries of which transport is very really close to us and forms of one of the three top industries we, we would like to, to have more work in. And um, so therefore, it's important for us to talk about uh, the, the technology side today. And I think uh, I want to look at the best practices, what is available uh, going forward. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tommy, for your kind support. We've got C-Track. Is there somebody from C-Track want to say a few words quickly? C-Track gold sponsor since the start of the Transport Forum. They say they assist their clients to transform their business with innovative software as, a, uh, software as a solution, internet of things, and mobile solutions. They're passionate about changing the way businesses communicate, collaborate, and operate around the world, allowing you to take action on insights from our cutting-edge devices and cloud platforms. Their support and hardware solutions come together in a clever, user-friendly, and powerful software system enabling your business to always be visible, always be visible, fleet management solutions and so forth. So thank you very much for C-Track. Global Trade Solution, somebody from GTS to say a few words. GTS is also a gold sponsor with a transport forum for already about two years, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, let's say they say it's a user-friendly cloud-based international trade and supply chain solution that incorporates the core requirements to manage all activities around the international supply chain in a compliant and cost-effective manner. GTS offers seamless integration of the various entities in the national supply chain, including the statutory agencies such as customs authorities, uh, which is also great as they, they, uh, they are the host for our event next week, Thursday, the 10th of June. Um, and it's going to be a very really great event in terms of international best practices and technology evolution. So thank you very much, GTS, for your kind support. Sutari, anybody from Sutari want to say a few words? So I'm doing the work again. Sutari, been a gold sponsor for around about eight years already with the Transport Forum. The, the broad collective of in-house industry recognized engineering consultants and Trusted devices provide seamless and integrated delivery. This unique ability to offer scout engagement allows Atari to solve complex challenges more effectively. Grounded in digital engineering, we continuously innovate to deliver better results. So Atari creates shared value and impact for our clients and the economies, environments, and communities we operate in. Thank you very much, Atari. But a cargo, but a cargo became a gold sponsor at the beginning of this year. So they were established in 1996 as Express Air Services, whose fleet of freight aircraft operated an overnight hub and spoke domestic network. Over the years, we have constantly involved as a business, learned lessons, and have made numerous changes to our business model. Now as Bit Air Cargo, we offer various African passenger airlines and air freight services agreement to manage the underutilized cargo capacity. The airline gains revenue for the cargo capacity with which bid air cargo managers and makes available to the express parcel industry. Uh, they've also developed other handling and marketing services for domestic and regional airlines. And in 2014, bid air cargo acquired the business of Imperial Air Cargo, which operates overnight freight service in South Africa with a fleet of dedicated B737 freight aircraft. Thank you, bid air cargo. 
Right, Cuba. Anybody from Cuba? Say a few words. Cuba has been a gold sponsor previously, known as Vix Technologies as well. Um, they gold sponsor for many years with the Transport Forum. They say at Cuba, we believe ticketing should be safe, simple, and secure. That's why we deliver ticket as a service. So it's all about integrated ticketing solutions, automatic fare collection, and they're delivering solutions to, to many of our major metros in South Africa, integrated fare collection. Thank you very much, Cuba. Standard Bank, maybe Kathy wanna tell us more about Standard Bank. Good morning, Harry. Um, so I think for the purposes of the meeting, I, I simply wanna say thank you, the opportunity we are always pleased and we are really keen to continue to support the Transport Forum. I think what is great is the opportunity for industry um, matters, relevant industry matters and discussions, robust discussions, very often uh, for it to have a platform. And uh, I think the Transport Forum achieves that. So thanks for the opportunity, Harry. And it's great to see all, even some of our international guests and it's great to see Prof Hensha. The last time I saw Prof Hensha was in, was in Singapore. So it's great to see all our international guests also joining in and um, looking forward to awesome, robust discussion. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Kathy, for your support. Really appreciate it. Standard Bing has been an ad hoc sponsor to the Transit Forum for many years. And last year, October, they joined us as a gold sponsor. So we're really proud and having Standard Bank on board. Thank you very much for your support and mentorship. Easy Clear, somebody from Easy Clear, perhaps? Easy Clear is a gold sponsor since January this year. EasyClear provide, provides software as a service to the freight forwarding, clearing, and logistics community in South Africa and neighboring BLNS countries. Uh, we strive to ensure service excellent through our expert team who understand the freight forwarding and custom clearing industry. We have also forged strong relationships with SAS, SAF, IATA, and TSBA to ensure that you, the client, are kept up to speed with industry developments and changes. Thank you very much, uh, very much, EasyClear. JC Auditors, don't know if all of us perhaps were first this morning. JC Auditors are gold sponsors since the start of this year. Um, JC Auditors accredited certifications are recognized globally. We work with clients and develop specific solutions. Our goal is to provide professional, efficient, and simplified certification solutions, enabling clients to achieve their business goals. Thank you, JC Auditors. Abunia Capital, Suicili, Majola, and her team have uh, been a gold sponsor since um, two years ago. Uh, Abunia is all about integrated public transport. They focus very much on the taxi industry as well to get them recognized as a full mode of transport in South Africa, doing very important work and consulting in that space. So do you need guidance or assistance or change management or whatever in that space? You're welcome to uh, contact uh, uh, Ubunia Capital. Obviously, all these uh, organizations' links are on our website, the Transport Forum website. So talking about the Transport Forum website, uh, the website is extremely popular. Um, and uh, there it is. Uh, the presentations you see here today will be uploaded to the Transport Forum website for you to download. Um, and it's all complimentary. So should you log into this uh, or visit this website, um, you should log in using your username and password. Should you not have a username and password, then you can go to, to sign up and you can create your own complimentary account. And then you'll have your own username and password and you log in. Once you've done that, you go to the site and you go to events and you select downloads. Uh, and then the downloads feature should give you a little search engine looking like that. You go to the title, the description, you can type in a, a person's surname or a topic like logistics or whatever. And if you click search, then it will search for presentations presented related to what you've typed in over the past 14 years. There are more than 900 presentations that you can search through, extremely powerful on this space. Or you can go to category and you can select the day's date of the event and it will bring up all the, the presentations of that day that's been made available. All right. Take a note of our business directory. Our business directory has been outsourced to uh, Bontle Consultants, Olga Mashilu, 
um, and they're running it and you can take note of that number, or you can take a picture of that number. Uh, the business directory is very popular. We're getting very good feedback from companies and it's only 450 rands per annum uh, to get listed or to be listed um, on uh, our business directory. So contact Olga and she'll help you to get your company listed on the business directory. It will be definitely worth your while. Right, that's now bringing us back to our program. And uh, you can see in the panel discussion spaces, we in each panel discussion at the start of the panel discussion, we're going to have a little bit of fun. Uh, and it's sponsored by uh, Huawei. That will give us in total six gifts this morning for uh, yeah, lucky winners. So what they will do, and Thomas Neyman is going to do this for us at the time of the, the lucky draw, whatever you want to call it, um, Tommy will have a question popping up in the chat room and the first three people that answer the question right, they will win uh, lucky draws or the, the, the gifts. And today they're going to have Bluetooth speakers. So thank you very much for while we're supporting that. So back to our program today, Improving Public Transport, International Best Practices. I would like to hand over to our host for the day, Professor Jackie Walters. He's from the Department of Transport and Supply Chain Management, University of Johannesburg. Thank you, Prof, for your kind support, and we're looking forward to your welcome and opening address. Thank you, Prof. Morning, Ari. Uh, morning, everybody. It's good to be here today. I uh, also like to have a, a special word of welcome to David Hinscher, Neil Smith, and, and others, international guests here today. I think it's going to be a great session, and we have a very nice day. Um, on behalf of our department uh, and uh, ITLS Africa, our research institute, I'd like to welcome you to the session officially. The uh, topic itself today is around public transport, improving public transport. It's a big area in South Africa uh, that's been neglected. We have basically have no rail services at the moment, passenger rail services due to vandalism. And uh, we are, we're very dependent on uh, and the bus industry, commuter bus industry on subsidies, and those are not what they should be. And then obviously around 80% of people in South Africa use taxis. So uh, we have a, but the one area that I think that's very important to us is that uh, contracting in public transport is uh, in, in, so our official policy. And um, today we're gonna to talk about uh, risks in contracts, contract design, and Neil Smith also to look at, for instance, the uh, designing a contract to get a, to get a good outcome. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll all benefit from this um, and we hope to, to get some good feedback on the session. I've got a few words to say, let me share my screen. Um, if I can find my presentation here. Uh, and Eddie, you'll have to help me. Here. Let me just see why, why can't I see my presentation. Uh, Shall I bring it up for you, Prof? Uh, yes, thank you. I'm not sure why. Can you bring it up? Okay. Uh, in a second, just give me a second. I'll be with you in a sec. Right, thank you very much. So we're uh, going to the next slide. Um, just a few words on the overview, uh, dealing with risk and public transport contract design, public transport contracting types, uh, allocation of risks, and then uh, some, some characteristics of the Mamelodi contract that we had last contract was put out to competitive tendering around 2018. 
and then um, some conclusions around that. Next slide, please, Harry. So if we look at um, risk in, in contract design, we, we have a number of risks. I think the first one is really uh, cost risk. Uh, where we have operational cost risk. And the question is who carries this risk on the possible variations of the cost of operating the services. And there we have two types of risks, external risks, and these cannot really be influenced by the operator it itself, like exchange rate, interest rates, and so on. And South Africa has really had a uh, up and down type experience with our exchange rates. Currently, the RAND dollar exchange is actually improving quite a lot compared to a year ago. And then some, some of these external risks you can influence on indirect manner, for instance, the energy price by buying more fuel efficient vehicles, price of spares, equipment, staff costs, and so on. So appropriate escalation indexes in South Africa's case is really very important uh, to deal with these external risks. Then you have the internal risks of the company, those that can really be managed by the operator indirectly, uh, also operational costs, maintenance costs, and so on. We have investment risks. Uh, who carries the risk of property and value of assets, infrastructure and vehicles, exchange rate fluctuations, and so on. And also revenue risk, very important in net cost contracts. Um, the revenue risk around the number of passengers that you are transporting, the major variation of passenger ridership, for instance, even when you open, we begin the service from the beginning, and fare levels and fare adjustments. Then other risks, uh, for, for example, operational complexity, such as complex network, new green technology vehicles, uh, South Africa is also moving in this direction and uh, the question is what happens to the older vehicles that you have the old diesel vehicles that you have when you replace them with new vehicles who carries those those costs so it's important to look at these costs uh, holistically when you are designing these contracts next slide please so just quickly for just to make sure you're all on the same page many people know this very well just go back Harry. Um, so the contracting types, we have net and gross cost contracts. In South Africa, we have both of them, but the majority are net cost contracts. And net cost contracts, the operator bears the revenue and the cost risks, uh, thus placing a greater responsibility on the authority to supply dependable information to potential bidders in order to achieve cost effective uh, and cost efficient bids. In gross cost contracts that you have in our BRT services, the operator bears the production cost of the service while the authority bears the revenue risks. And if you look at our policies, we are, intend to go more towards gross cost contracts, but uh, at this point in time, all the commuter bus services excepting for the uh, BRT services are net cost contracts. A study amongst our bus operators was found that operators have very strong views on both the revenue and the cost risks embedded in these contracts. Next slide, please. So this comes from a document produced uh, by the European Commission. And you'll see, on the, if you look at um, depicting these risks, you'll see on the left of this graph at the top, you have low level of risk, and those are typically management contracts of, of, of services. And then on the extreme right, you have high levels of risk, which are net cost contracts because the operator carries the revenue and the production uh, risks in producing the services. And in the middle between the two, you have the gross cost contract uh, where, um, the revenue risk is not, does not sit with the operator, it sits with the authority. So those are three types of contracts. I could just mention that in the latest subsidy policy documentation and policy statements of, of the Department of Transport, they, they are looking at management contracts, uh, which we don't necessarily agree with, but, but management contracts uh, going forward. Uh, but a lot of discussions still has to take place around that. Um, next slide, please. So the allocation of risk uh, can be shown in various ways. We have always no risk, like a management contract. It's just managing the services. You don't have the revenue, the production cost risk, although one, like, one can design service, obviously that management has a major responsibility in meeting specific targets. Uh, the, uh, then the operator bears the cost risk, so the gross cost contract, and operator bears the cost and revenue risk, the net cost contract. So um, in designing these contracts, authority has to decide how to allocate these risks. Low risk is predictable for operators. Operators will calculate a low risk premium. If, if you look at a high risk, high uncertainty, which is critical for the operator, high uncertainty on passion numbers, for instance, uh, re uh, revenues and so on, operators will calculate a high risk premium in, in pricing that specific contract. Then you could also have an unbearable risk, which is where most of these risks are unpredictable and critical for the operator. So it's not bearable for the operator 
and it could even be an entry barrier to the market itself. And you often have very few bidders in such cases. So these are types of risks that one can perceive when you're evaluating a tender documentation to, in, in, in a view of bidding for a specific service. Next slide, please. So uh, it's also important to look at flexibility during contracting. Um, changes in forecast passions and volumes after commencement of services require flexibility in contracting arrangements. We have such bans in South Africa in our current contracts, but it should also be in the new contracts themselves. Also changes in external factors, political aims or passions and needs may lead to amendments to service designs during the contract period. This will lower the risk for the operator. And in most contracts then also need to be rene renegotiated, maybe in part or elements of it during their lifetimes. Long-term contracts, if you look at seven-year contracts, is relatively long. But there's a need for some flexibility and re-looking at some of those input cost factors, especially if you have high inflation or major fluctuations in exchange rates and so on. So the rule, but it's very important that the rules of the game, so to speak, be agreed up front so the contract stability is ensured and that the operator and the authority, do, they do see eye to eye around these changes, if and when and how it should be done in, in the contract itself. Next slide, please. So against that background, um, we, the last tendered contract that we had in South Africa was around 2018, and I'm not gonna deal with it extensively. It was dealt with last year at the Threadbow Conference in Singapore um, extensively and also published uh, research, uh, research and transport economics uh, late last year. But if you look at the Mamelodi contract, some characteristics, basic information about the number of kilometers and passenger routes were provided. And for 27, 24 of the 77 shifts, total information was available and bidders had to verify the route distances and passenger loads for these shifts. But they had a difficulty in doing this because this tender was put out over the Christmas holiday period and the tenders had to be in um, early in, in January. So they could not really verify this. And you can just imagine a seven year contract, you don't have all that information that, and you have to bid. And um, there was no guarantee on the accuracy of the given information. And the contract was a net cost contract over a seven year period. It also did not have an escalation clause and it relied on the, on the annual increase determined by South Africa's National Treasury through the Public Transport Operations Grant. And these increases are not linked to the cost Cost the input cost of bus oper uh, operations. Uh, bidders also had to submit the contract value, had to, had to, uh, had to uh, submit, sorry, this, this picture's just come up from David on, on top of the screen here. Bidders had to submit the contract value for the first year's operations, and the subsidy available for the service was 37.7 million for the year. That was what was aimed for. So if you look, if you look at the background of information I've just given you and looking at what we had in the Mamelodi contract, it's very evident that bidders had to assume high financial risks over the contracting period, which affected tender prices adversely. Uh, next slide, please, Harry. So if you look at the, uh, the survey I did was around five bidders, five of the eight participated in the survey post the award of the contract. And you'll see with the first blue arrow, if you look at annual passion trip estimates and the bidders A, B, C, D, and you can see the five bidders there, you can see the passion trip estimates uh, vary significantly from 397,000 uh, um, trips, 2.7 million trips, 715,000 trips, and so on. Huge variances there. And this is because, in my view, the uh, information that was given was not adequate. And if you look at the, the the effect of this uncertainty in this contract design, if you look at the subsidy, the next arrow there, subsidy as percentage of the available subsidy, you'll see in the first bidder was 120% of the available subsidy higher, 22% the second one, the third bidder 75% higher than the 37 million that was available, the fourth bidder 93% and bidder E 90%. So it speaks for itself that these bidders had to factor in some of those risks that I mentioned in the contract design when they bid for the services. Uh, they could not verify the passion numbers and kilometers and so on, because they, it's, over the holiday period, many people were on leave and so on. So this is a real, this was a real problem as far as this contract was, con was concerned. Eventually it was not awarded because of the high cost of these bids. Um, next slide, please. Just 
A few conclusions. In conclusion to this introductory talk, uh, lack of an appropriate escalation clause was seen as problematic by the bidders. When you had interviews with them, they said they cannot tender for a, for a seven year period with all this uncertainty. And on top of that, there's no proper escalation clause. Um, and they don't know what escalation would be, you know, over the seven year period. There was, there was really poor contract design, this feedback from these operators, poor contract design, poor information and the inappropriate apportionment of risks affecting the contract's pricing. And in closing, just two remarks. Authorities need to understand how bidders view these characteristics of their contract designs. It's very important that they do interact with them post the bid to see what the issues were that these bidders had in evaluating their tenders, tender designs. Especially things such as the operating conditions, contract specifications, and heavy production cost risk. Um, and this is very important in net cost contracts as we have in South Africa and these, these normal community of our services where the operator bears the revenue and the cost side of these risks. So it's important that authorities, in closing, also needs to, need to learn from each, each contract how bidders viewed their designs and how it affected their cost and revenue estimates in order to improve their designs and appropriately apportion contracting risk to the party or parties that could carry these risks the best. So, uh, uh, Harry, this is just an introduction. I think it's very important in going forward, it's clear that we're going to have more contracts going forward, hopefully not too distant future, because we haven't had new contracts really since 20, uh, what, the last 20, 22 years. And um, in, in designing these contracts, it's very important that, that the authorities also work with the operators. You know, I'm not saying they should be in the bed of these operators and designing these services, but it's very important that they understand how operators view risks and what they'd like to see in these contracts. And at the end of the day, it's in the best interest of both parties. The operator can put in a very competitive bid and the authority will get value for money in terms of the services being operated. So with those few words, thank you very much to everybody. I hope you enjoy the session. Harry, thank you for your custodianship and organizing this uh, session. We really appreciate it. We, we love our relationship that we have with you in, in this transport forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Jackie. Um, we're dependent on your relationship, so thank you very much for your continued support through all these years. We really appreciate that and for being our host today. We really appreciate that. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, improving public transport, international best practices. Um, as you can see, we've got two international presenters here today. Prof. Andrea Gurison and also Mr. Neil Smith later on uh, after lunch. Uh, the reason why the session started at 10 o'clock today, not the usual 9 o'clock, is we were supposed to have uh, a lady from Brazil presenting. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it anymore. And uh, so that's why we, we moved the session after lunch because Brazil is six hours behind us. Uh, but she unfortunately had to pull out. So we, we decided not to change the entire program and, and so on. Um, but yes, so we've got important people here from in Italy. We've got Mr. Jack Namara, who's the CEO of the Gauteng Transport Authority. We've got Mr. Basil Gallander, who's the executive manager of Saboa. We've got Tommy Sneiman, who's an industry expert from Huawei International Organization. And then Mr. Neil Smith, um, the international public transport specialist. And I'll tell you more, tell you more about Neil before he presents. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give you Professor Dr. Andrea Gurison. Um, he's a transport economist uh, from the University of Milan, and he's going to talk to us about regulation in the public transport international business case. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you, Ari. Thank you to all. And uh, it's a very pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, I have to tell that uh, thanks to the presentation of Professor Walters, because uh, already made a lot of my presentation, but anyway, I will go very fast on the net contrast, <laughs> gross cost, and so, and so on because of that. So I have here uh, my presentation that I hope that you can see. Uh, I think so. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so my experience, uh, as Harry told, uh, it, I, I come from a, a center of research at University of Milan Bicocca. Uh, that is uh, especially on regulation and, and about regulation in transportation sector i work all around the world with uh, my consultancy company but also with the world bank so it's a honor to be here in south 
in South Africa speaking uh, about the example that we can have all around the world. Uh, my experience is coming from also the rail in the high speed rail, working with the first high speed rail operator. And also I teach uh, several parts of the world, including uh, China for the China Academy of Railway Science. And I work with the first uh, uh, public transport operator in Italy. So I will try to give a little bit of experience from a regulation point of view, not to be too much academic, to be more, uh, more practice on the, that side. So first of all, uh, when we spoke about PSO contract, uh, I know that uh, uh, it's already told, so I don't want to lose too much time on that uh, on that slide. We have to take in consideration that uh, we have a normally gross cost, net cost contract. It was very, very well explained. We have the role of a local authority, regional level, and, and also the revenue risk, uh, as we saw, could be very, very different. I want just to add a small point, because uh, what happened here in Europe uh, due to the pandemic, due to the COVID-19, many of operators have a big problem, especially when they have a net cost contract. And it's uh, very, very important because if the revenue risk is uh, for the public transport operator and this kind of big event is uh, unexpected, uh, the, 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 the damage for this uh, operator is uh, very, very, very strong. Different uh, from the company with the gross cost because uh, we have the authority that covers this commercial risk, this uh, revenue risk. So this is just a little bit uh, the small point that I want to tell. The other element, so I will go past on this slide. Uh, another element, so when we spoke uh, about public transport in Europe, many times we include also the commuter rail. So what is uh, include the regional rail? The public transport is not only in the cities, but is also, for example, commuter rail, the metro system and so on. So uh, maybe it's also um, depending of every single country and every single area of the world, but of course, when we spoke about uh, rail or metro, uh, what is uh, very, very important is uh, one of the main voice of the CAPEX, uh, the capital expenditure, of course, is uh, uh, the rolling stock. And the rolling stock is not easy to find. It's quite a long process to acquire and so on. So it's an element that many times is uh, really an entry barrier. What we saw for many contracts is an entry barrier for new entrants to you or to, to enter in some of the contracts. So this is an element that has to be taken in mind that is uh, very, very important in uh, our case that we have uh, many times in Europe. About the cost control, uh, because uh, of course we, we spoke about the revenue risk, uh, so the commercial risk. It, what is very important to take in mind is, uh, first of all, the element that was very well presented in the case of South Africa, the level of subsidies uh, that has to be taken in mind and also the level of tariff. Uh, many times the level of tariff is, uh, very political decision uh, we can tell quite all the time is a very political decision and the level of subsidies as we saw is not easy to be calculated but we really need to pay attention on that because of course if we don't calculate very well the risk is that uh, we have a tender without uh, no companies that want to participate or we have a just incumbent in many cases in europe that continue to have that contract because they, they have less risk on that side because they have more information than the other new entrants that want to operate on that service. So, of course, the other element is not just the government, the authorities, that is a key element, but also the trade union is a very, very important, especially in Europe, where uh, this kind of sector, the public transport sector, the trade union in Europe is, are very, very strong. The other element that we have to take in consideration. So the first element, how we cover the cost per vehicle kilometer or per train kilometer, we need to cover with subsidies and tariff. Uh, that means is the, the revenue, how it's coming. From the part of cost, we need to take in consideration that in some case we have the access charge. So the use of the infrastructure uh, have a cost and that has to be, is fixed dependently in every single country could be very fixed in, in very different way. I will give you an example from Germany and from Italy. The other element is the investment for the next period. So when we have a contract, also the level of investment is a key element to take in mind what has to be the total cost for that contract. Because if we need to have a new fleet uh, with the hydrogen train, train, for example, we start to discuss in Europe about hydrogen train, probably you need a big investment and of course has to be included in the contract. So the investment is very important. The other element that was already discussed is the flexibility of the contract. The COVID-19 was a key example. If we don't have flexibility of contract, we, we really risk a, a very big problem with the operator, with the public transport operator. 
So the other two actors is uh, that the other two stakeholders, sorry, that are very important is the independent authority. Uh, we have one at national level normally in Europe that is the authority for regulation of transport that fix or set the, the, of the rules, the framework. And then we have the, uh, the uh, local agencies or the local authority that normally make the tenders for different services. So we have a double structure of the authority uh, in many cases in Europe. And then we have infrastructure manager, especially for the commuter rail, that is the manager of the infrastructure. That could be a different company, depending also here, but normally it's a different company from the railway undertaking that uh, uh, manage the services. Uh, so if the railway undertaking is uh, separate from the infrastructure manager, it could be totally separated or holding structure, but it depending on every single country. So just about uh, very quickly, that short introduction, because Professor, uh, Professor Walters may very, very well, uh, just going to the to the business case. So the liberalism uh, we have in Italy uh, a very um, not a good case in terms of liberalization of the public transport sector in commuter rail. At the opposite of the high speed rail, for example, in Italy we were the first country to have the open access uh, competition in the high speed rail. It was the first country. It is the first country in the world to have that. So we opened the long distance market, but we don't really open uh, to the tender. Uh, the uh, regional services, so the commuter rail and the public transport services. Uh, many, in many cases, we don't have a real tender for that. Even if the process uh, is in the next year, we hope that we will go in this uh, direction of tendering. Uh, anyway, uh, we create an authority, a, a general authority, that is named Authority for Regulation of Transport, that was settled at the beginning of 2012, even if they start the the operation in 2014 because it was quite a long process to create that but anyway the authority start to have some power in fixing the rules about the public transport tender and the commuter rail tender this is a very important all the all the countries in europe in general they have a strong authority of regulation of transport you have we can find in france we can find that with a different name that is cmsa in uh, in um, in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in spain for example uh, and so on. So, but this is very, very important because the authority is a sort of regulation body that gives the settlement of rules in the regional public transport market. And uh, for example, already six years ago, right now, they publish the, the, the rules to have a, the tender for the public transport, even if then the region that have the, the rules to, uh, give, to make the tender for the commuter, they don't make it yet in many cases. And they, also the cities that have have the power to make the tender for the public transport at the, for the urban area. For example, we don't have yet about that. So what happened, for example, so I will give two examples, two uh, benchmarking around the Europe, uh, especially around Europe. So what happened first in the commuter rail and then in the public transport? The commuter rail is very, very interesting because, uh, for example, we have the example of Germany, where in the late 90s, we start the process of tendering and what is the result of this tendering uh, with a, a real competitive uh, market for the commuter rail? We saw that, uh, first of all, the part of competitive market uh, right now is around 70% of the total market. So even if it's a regional decision to open to the market, we saw a good element and a good uh, process of liberalization. And what happened that with the higher number of services, in general, we have a decrease of the subsidies from the from the from the uh, from uh, the region in this case, we saw a decrease of the subsidies around 27, 28 percent at the same level at the same level of the services. So having tendering in Germany I have a good, great result because we have an increase of the services with, with a lower cost for the uh, for the uh, for the community for the taxpayer, and this is a very important element to take in mind. And at the opposite. When we saw the Lombardy region, that is the region of Milan, is a big contract that still for the commuter rail is given to one operator, so without no real competitive tender. And what we saw that the cost is increasing uh, because uh, there's a direct contract uh, between the operator and the and the and the and the regional authority. And what we saw is that the the cost is increasing, and this is not good. And we hope that in the next year, and I will uh, go to the next to the last slide to show that uh, in reality we are changing finally the system, and probably in the next year we will have competition also in Italy. 
And uh, if we compare uh, the subsidies and tariff, uh, what I told at the beginning, for example, we saw that the, the level, uh, the total level of the subsidies in Germany, for example, is lower than in Lombardy region, even if uh, probably the GDP per capita is quite the same level. So we are at quite the same level of GDP. But what we saw that the tariff uh, for the ticket is at quite the same level, but the subsidies in Germany is much lower than in Italy. So the competitive process happen and it's well done this kind of uh, regional tender we have international player that uh, make big investment in germany entering in the commuter rail on germany what happened that finally the level of subsidies uh, went down and we have a good result in terms of a good part of the market so if we compare with lombardy for example we have a very good result on that uh, term another element that we have to consider that is uh, not only the part of, uh, this is a data that is a little bit uh, older because we don't have uh, many data that is a similar problem that uh, you find in, uh, in South Africa, but also in Europe, we have many, many problems of uh, have good data for the operator. But another element that we have to take in consideration is this yellow color. The yellow color is the level of the access charge. So for using the infrastructure, the railway operator has to pay the infrastructure charge. Uh, that is uh, the access charge for using the infrastructure in Germany is much, much higher. So with the level of uh, subsidies and tariff in Germany, we can cover without any problem also an higher level of access charge. In Italy, the access charge is lower. So the, for using infrastructure, the access charge is lower. But uh, 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 even if the access charge is lower, finally, the total cost is higher because of uh, no competition, uh, no competition in the sector. Uh, and the access charge for PSO, the regional services, is very important because it's the majority of the kilometers that we have for the infrastructure manager in Italy in general. So the access charge for the PSO services, for regional services, is very, very important also from the infrastructure manager in general in Italy because we have one single infrastructure manager for all the infrastructure, quite all the infrastructure in Italy. Uh, another element that has to be taken in consideration is uh, the how much is a uh, full train. For example, in Italy, the regional train have a very, very uh, high uh, number of passengers. So in theory, we can have higher uh, efficiency of the system. But even if we have more passengers on board, finally, we saw that the, that uh, we finally saw that the system is not working very, very well. So there's need of change of the system in Italy with the real tender with the full disclosure information, and then I will show better. I hope that I have enough time. Yeah, I will finish in uh, three, four minutes. And uh, just another business case for the, um, for the cities, for the public transport. So we are speaking about bus services, tram services, tramway services, and metro services. Here you can see two cases in Italy that are quite different. One is the Rome case that is ATAC company, that is a public transport operator from the city. You have ATM in Milan that is much more efficient and then you have best practice in Europe. And this is the cost per vehicle kilometer. You can see that we have some cases in Italy that we are quite three times higher cost uh, per vehicle kilometer in comparison with the best practice in Europe. This is a big problem because also here we don't have tender. And also here, there's a strong impact on the fact that the human resources cost is too high. And this is because there's strong control and impact of political level. So it's not easy for the, uh, for the cities to not manage the infrastructure, to not manage the public transport operator because they want to maintain the control also on the 11,000 people working here. And here is needed a very strong separation between who is making the tender that in Italy still is made by the cities, uh, in this case, for the public transport authority, and who is managing the services that in Italy that full superposition between the two. So this is a very high risk. We need the real tender with the separation with a good authority that is able to make a good tendering with a full disclosure of the data. Why of that? Because if we have more efficiency in public, in public transport with a good regulatory framework, with the same number of the same uh, money with the same subsidies, we can have more public transport. Is what happened in Germany, for example, and what happened in other cases all around Europe. But if we have more public transport, we are able also to reach better and to have more passenger. If we have more passenger, for example, we have less traffic because there's less congestion and also less pollution. But if we have less traffic, of course, we have a higher average speed. So this is a little bit the, the case 
when you start to have a very good system that's working very well, you can have high at the end a more efficient system that is making more efficiency too, because with a higher average speed for the public transport, also you have more efficiency that have a final result that finally the, the system is going well and well. So here you have some elements that you have to discuss to have a good tendering. So uh, for example, you have uh, to need to very good specification of every single uh, voice of cost, for example, for the maintenance, uh, you need to think about the transfer of staff, for example, what is the level of transfer of staff that is needed. And uh, you need also to understand very well what is, for example, the criteria for determining the value of takeover between the old operator and the new operator. All these uh, elements has to be uh, more and more taken in account by the authority of regulation of transport, but still is not uh, used by the cities to go in this direction. What is needed is to go to real full disclosure of the data to have a full information, to have a very good uh, contract, a very good uh, tender uh, in the uh, public transport. So this is my last slide, so sorry for that. I think that I finished quite on time, but what is needed more and more, and, is, uh, and what the, the international example show very well, that the competition with the tender process is really needed. We really need to go in this direction. We really need the, the creation of the agency that are able to have full data, because many times the data is for the operator, but is not given by uh, the agency, but we need a full disclosure of all the data because the risk has to be taken in consideration by, by the private operator. We need the supervision of authority of regulation of transport to fix the good rules on that. And finally, what is needed uh, that many times is not done in Italy, but is done, for example, for commuter rail in uh, Germany, is at the end, if we have a good system, we are able to attract the private investment and we have an increase of productivity of the sector and we have a final benefit for the city, for example, with the less congestion and so on, that is a good and less pollution, that is a two elements that is more and more considered in the target of the cities. So with that, I finish my very short presentation. I hope that uh, this some small data that we have from other countries can have uh, uh, to enlarge the discussion also for South Africa. Also from the mistake that we have in Italy, for example, we can learn a lot for other countries. So uh, when I discuss all around the world about this, we have to learn from mistakes to have a better system, to have a more efficient system and to have a better solution for the customer. Thank you very much. Indeed, thank you so much, Prof. Andrea. Um, so interesting and, and thank you very much for, for uh, the, this presentation. We're learning so much from you. And this high average speed is so important, and the regulation and te teaching us about that. Thank you very much. Uh, would you be available for the panel discussion uh, hours so later? Thank you very much. We are looking you. forward to engaging with the panel discussion with you then. Thank you so much. Right, ladies and gents, let, let me just put up our program again. Right, ladies and gents, we're still talking about improving public transport. We've got Mr. Jack van der Meeren next up. He's the Chief Executive Officer of the Gauteng Transport Authority, Gauteng Transport Authority. You know, he was previously the CEO of the Gauteng Management Agency. Now he's the Chief Executive Officer of the Gauteng Transport Authority. And uh, Mr. van der Meeren is going to talk about contract design of public transport, the GTI approach. Thank you so much, Jack. We're looking forward to listening to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Harry. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to get my slides up here. Um, Harry, are you seeing that? You see that? You can just go to slideshow mode, please, Jack. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to do something totally different. Um, we've just started the Transport Authority, so I'm actually looking at, at what the impediments are. Um, I like what Jackie said. 
um, in the beginning. Um, and seeing that we've only done one bus contract, I'm also going to refer to the Mamalodi contract. But I think what is what is true is that if uh, the information that's supplied in a contract is not sufficient, it's not um, totally what you want, um, the contractor has no option but to price that risk in. But that's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that if you have a fixed budget, then um, and you have a, a contract that's been marked up, the only thing that can suffer is you would be able to give less service. So you will you will actually run backwards by by uh, not being able to to supply the service to enough people. Another thing which is important in our case is that um, there's a subsidy policy being developed by National Department of Transport at the moment, and I really want to ask the industry to try and be part of this the system because that subsidy policy is going to be cast in stone for quite a quite a long um, a long time. Right, so if I can just go on. Um, I like this quote. I want to make this the quote of, uh, of the Transport Authority. It says, adding lanes to solve traffic congestion is like loosening your belt to solve obesity. So I want to be very careful on what your, what your strategy is. <laughs> what is. What is a contract? A contract is a legally binding document between at least two parties that defines and governs their rights and duties. Um, terms of the agreement. So uh, it, it's a legal document. Contract is legally enforceable. Uh, contract is typically involves the exchange or delivery of something. The promise of doing that and the breach of contract means that the law will have to uh, award the injured party either access to legal remedies such as costs or cancellation. So, so, so this is the heart of it. Now, if one looks at, at the contract, the last one, the breach of contract, you know, a contract is usually 10 pages. Then you give it to the lawyers, and the lawyers start asking questions. What if? What if this happens? What if that happens? That adds another two hundred pages to the to the to the document, and and this breach of contract uh, becomes a, a a big issue. Now, if you have a standard contract, there is case law that will actually de-risk the project. So so one mustn't have a try and be smart and have a different contract for every time that you do it because you have no case law and then everything in the contract has to be tested in court and it, it takes a lot of time and money. And remember, if you go to, to court, um, the only person who is, is sure to win is the legal team because they can make it paid whether you win or lose, but the, the, the issue is uh, what happens to the client and what happens to the contract. So, you know, um, Contracts should be easy. It should be the project identification or the in initiation of a project. You identify need for a public service. You determine the priority. You secure the funding. You define the scope of the project. You start the supply chain management process. The supply chain management process is the approach to the market selected by the success of them. In our country, the supply chain management process has become a minefield. It's become so regulated just to try and stop corruption. And I'm of the opinion, all that it does, it messes around the honest people, the crooks in any case just bypass it. So uh, it doesn't help much. But this supply chain management process, which should be really an easy process, has become very complicated and, uh, and, 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 and very difficult. The project um, execution, we did, it's a delivery of the project within scope, um, time and budget. There's monitoring and certification. There's completion and handover of the asset. And then it goes into operational maintenance. Now, um, in our country, we like doing just the, the top three, and operations and maintenance becomes the, um, the, the worry of the client. Um, and only in PPP contracts does the operation and maintenance form part of, of the contract. Um, I like this a, a projected, a protected boat bicycle lane in a city in a developing country is a powerful tool showing that the citizen. On the 450 rand bicycle is as important as one in a 450,000 rand car. And I think that's what we, we should do. So, um, a lot of things that from
seem to me there's a problem on Jack's side. I'll give, give him a call quickly. Yes, Jack Nebron, let's say you have to of each game. Yes, yeah. Yeah, no problem. It's a band with drop down. So. No, 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 Guys, just a few seconds. Jack is just rejoining the, the session. We'll be with you in a second. Okay, guys, Jack, Jack is still joining the session. He's got a technical issue there. So let's get uh, Basil Govender uh, from Sabawa to start with his presentation. And then after Basil is done, hopefully Jack will then be able to join the session again. So Basil, if you can do your presentation, Basil is the executive manager of the South African Bus Operators Association. He's going to talk about public transport contracting, um, challenges, imminent changes, and what actions can be taken to protect the industry the interest of the industry. Thank you, uh, Basil. Thanks, Ari. Let me just get started. How's it looking on your side? Uh, just slideshow mode. Perfect. Thank you, Basil. Good stuff. Thank you, everybody. Good morning. Uh, let me just get my, do you need my video on? Bandwidth is an issue all around, they say. Hello, folks. Good morning. Uh, our guests from overseas, thank you very much. And looking forward to the rest of the program. 
Yeah, so uh, given, and Jack was leading nicely, perfectly into my presentation in, the, in some of the highlights he was presenting. So you'll see a common thread coming through, some of the things already picked up uh, by Professor Walters. So yeah, plenty of challenges in the South African public transport sphere. So I'm talking about what next with a little bit of a preview of what we've had to experience. So I might just take away from Jack's follow up when he does come back. But uh, you know, going forward, Uh, you know, you can't go forward without looking at where we've come from. And this has been well documented in the past and through the years. Uh, there's historical legacy problems, which we're grappling with, we've grappled with forever. And I think there's been numerous attempts at trying to get it right or, or being prescriptive about how we get it right. But I think essentially we need to understand that uh, there are legacies from the apartheid government special planning and the related transport challenges that have ensued are still with us, even though we've developed into a democratic dispensation. So the policies and various iterations of policies that have been created, they talk to the intent, but I think transforming uh, and fixing previous or inherited systems and challenges can't have only intent. It must have will and implementation and execution. So I think therefore, we are battling and uh, of, of the recent years, if you think about it, and certainly through the last year, uh, it's becoming evident that there's a disconnect between the different tiers of government uh, across up and down and inter and intra-governmental processes. So that's a major stumbling issue in trying to implement effect change in any systems. But however, uh, you know, we now find ourselves in a static state. We know what we want, we know where we want it, and we're grappling with how we want it. So I'll be talking to some of those issues, but I think uh, uh, critically to what Prof and, Jack, uh, Prof and Jack have said, well, Jackie and Jack have said, subsidy is a big issue. Uh, all these processes coming from the legacy uh, inheritance that we have and looking forward, there's an ever increasing gap in terms of what the subsidy provided for is now and what the subsidy required is in actual terms. Jackie alluded to that in the, some of those uh, slides with the tender of the Mamalodi contract, but it's creating a log jam. And I think ultimately, uh, collectively, the industry has a role to play and needs to take some of the responsibility of the situation that we're facing as well. Uh, but if we don't, address it and don't transform it, this logjam is going to create losers and everybody loses in the public transport sphere. So that's enough for a background. Uh, what do I want to talk to you about today? The key issues that I play, funding, safety and security, uh, current contract conditions and uh, some of the perceptions, uh, some policy and legislative uncertainty, uh, briefly link those four items which are coming out critically in the perception of the public from the National Household Transport Survey of 2020. I've pulled out some extracts that should matter that talk to all these four issues. And then briefly uh, try and cover some ground as what we want as recommendations going forward. Okay, folks, so funding issues. This is a burning one. Depending on who you talk to in the industry, it's almost always Without funding, this is how we see funding. And we've never come, we seem to be growing apart rather than getting closer to the objective of uh, commonality with funding issues. So since the Division of uh, Revenue Act in 2009, the increases in subsidy have been through the PTOG. So the escalation formulas and the stuff that's inherently in contracts have not really come to bear. And as you can see on the screen, so I've just pulled a snapshot of the PTLG allocations, 21, 22, the current year, 7.1 billion, 22, 23, inconceivable that you can actually talk to a decrease in funding from one financial year to the other, and then talk to another increase 
in the year after. So if you, if you snapshot that in the current year, uh, effective one April, operators or contracts were escalated at 5.5%. Uh, we're talking a decrease of 0.43% next year and then back to a 4.4. So whilst broadly within the ambits of inflation indices, costs never escalate in the same band as inflation. So the government's very targeted in managing inflation, but in the public transport sphere, uh, fuel costs, labor costs, maintenance costs, just bear testimony that there's a widening gap between what the subsidy allocations are giving in terms of increases in actual costs. So it has coined the term underfunding. Now again, wherever you have debates and discussions around public transport and commercial contracts or contracted operations, the word underfunding comes through. What impact does this have? A lot of detail, yes, so I'll go through it uh, as well paced as I can. Some of the key ones I've pulled out, owner and shareholder and investor sentiments are starting to dissipate. So there's the appetite for continued investment is going away. There's a direct impact on liquidity and cash flow constraints. It affects amongst many things, direct impact on technological advancements, innovating in public transport. It's a general slowdown in CapEx, asset replacement programs. It leads to an average age of the bus fleet that is increasing or worsening, if depending how you look at it. This is further eroded by the fact that the current or existing fleet is also deteriorating. Now, critically, what happens is if there's a drop in the appearance of uh, public transport fleet, the public has a negative perception about the service that's being rendered, and it erodes public tr trust in the systems. Okay. Uh, downward trends in profitability. I think if you talk to most operators, if not all of them, not one has shown a reverse in the in the curve or the graph of downward trends on profitability. It brings about the cash flow pressures, and cash flow pressures have a direct correlation to drop in quality of preventative maintenance programs, procurement processes, and critically, the the sector or the industry has a long and extended value chain or supply chain. Any cough in the industry is going to have an impact and a knock-on effect on supply chain and service providers. So it's being felt down the line as well. Uh, Jackie mentioned it, and we are seeing more and more the traditional institutions of financing uh, have eased back on funding, uh, are, are looking at it more stringently, primarily due to policy uncertainty and associated risks. Uh, the bus building OEM sector starting to feel the impact. Uh, on the production lines, it also affects processes around other legislation we're trying to get into place for localization and local content, which assists job creation. And I think an important one, this whole entire process is, is regressing the environment and new entrants in the market sector and SMMEs are reaching, are hitting a barrier that's becoming higher and harder to surpass. But ultimately, the biggest loser through all of this, I think, uh, is the public at large. They're not getting the quality they deserve and the sustainable service that they deserve at equitable costs. One of the things I think uh, Jack and his team and many contracting authorities will face uh, coming forward is uh, we continue to progress our transport network independently I call it on three tiers within the bus sector, but all of us are competing, but not complementing the services. So you get municipal bus services, the infrastructure and the facilities are maintained by the municipality or the metro. The, the introduction of BRT services create purpose-built high-end infrastructure and facilities. And then you're sitting with the contracted commuter services that have through the years inherited or have little to no designated facilities and are still loading on the side of the roads, open areas, makeshift depots, uh, and where there are facilities, some of them pretty scant, 
the formal infrastructure and facilities are not maintained and there's no accountability for that. So there's a, another peculiar phenomenon that transcends within the South African PTOG allocation, not just the transport department, but it seems a, 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 a across the board uh, problem. The funds allocated by Treasury are transferred to the national by national department and then to provincial departments to administer. And they administer the contracts resident at their provincial level. There's been a consistent trend over the years for that total allocation to be underutilized or not fully uh, appropriated. And there's various reasons, but if you had to cycle it, uh, if there's been a period of suspension or slowing down of bus replacement programs, so there's a decline in the fleet condition. This ultimately translates to affected service levels and in some cases, non-performance. So from a subsidy point of view, there's a saving in subsidy payments because of penalties. Now, sometimes, and in cases, there's been millions of rands out of the PTOG that are not used for the very purpose that they are supposed to provide safe, affordable, accessible transport. I'll give you an, an example of what the potential looks like in the next slide. But what happens is all unused allocations are returned to treasury or possibly redirected for other purposes that are prioritized at that point. So now the state of play at end of February 2021, which was one month away from the financial year end, uh, for the last financial year end, a total of 1.8 billion, approximately 27.5% of the PTOG was still unused one month away from the financial year. Okay, there might have been a COVID impact in terms of uh, uh, restricted services or lower services and that kind of thing. But in my interactions with the provincial departments at the end of March, many provinces had not used those allocations and they had requested concurrence from the national treasury to roll it over to the new year. In the same period, there was a uh, portfolio committee and a treasury decision uh, uh, to set aside 5% of the PTOG for COVID relief 19 to public transport. But, and that totaled to around 337 million, but very little or no assistance was given to bus operators. Much has been said about COVID. I'm not gonna spend too much time, but once again, I think I stress here the biggest loser is turning to be the beneficiary of public transport. Quickly for you to show how that breaks down, I said 1.8 billion, but if you look at it, funds unspent by provinces as at February, 2021. And like I said, in my uh, interactions with provinces, most if not all of them have not used that full amount. So you're talking significant amounts of money that are underutilized and or returned to national treasury. Safety and security, I thought, needed its own space because there are new and emerging trends uh, within the public transport space. Destruction of public transport assets facilities is not a new phenomenon. However, the levels of crime, vandalism, and violent protests are escalating nationally, but both in nature and in frequency. So that's a huge concern. Uh, for the, for the sustainability going forward. Buses are now seen as a really easy target uh, for communities that are experiencing service level issues or protest action becomes uh, a nature of getting attention by burning buses to vent our dissatisfaction. Uh, and that's pretty much on the increase. Uh, intermodal violence and destruction also prevalent in all parts of the country. There's contestation for routes and uh, ridership persist. So, but one of the new and major concerning trends is that of an increased number of incidents where now commuters are held hostage on a bus that is mobile whilst they're en route in transit. And the high prevalence of this is now centered around the Western Cape or the city of Cape Town bus routes. And one of the operators, Golden Arrow, has been extensively affected by that. But it does appear that the gangs are targeting commuters on buses as soft targets, but at the same time, perceiving to be cash collection on buses as 
quick access to cash. Uh, so we need to be very aware of that. Uh, then also with regards to current public transport facilities and, and or intermodal facilities, the general lack of sustainable maintenance and upkeep creates a perception that these facilities are old and cannot be trusted or used or neglected. So then there's a lack of security around it. It compounds dereliction and it leads to vandalism. So there's an ongoing erosion of our facilities. Just as a side note, uh, Saboa is, uh, is hosting a webinar on the 17th of June as part of a strategy to countenance violence and destruction in the public transport space with the outcomes to try and cross, craft a strategy, a policy framework uh, to countenance this threat. And then we drill a bit deeper on the 1st of July to deal with the financial and insured risks emanating from the losses. Okay, on to the critical issues, contract conditions. Uh, much has been said already about contract conditions. I won't repeat my, most of it. Inception dates range between 1997 and 2009. And uh, as Jackie said, last tendered processes was 2018. Uh, between the gross and net contracts sitting inside there, we've got tendered interim or negotiated contracts. Uh, there has been a moratorium on tendered contracts uh, for a bit, but on the interim and negotiated contracts, the defined designs and inflexibility means that Operators cannot just add routes or trips for demand when it is there. They cannot reduce or amend schedules to eliminate low demand or underutilized trips. Impacts that is directly impacting on public and community sentiment because the public doesn't understand contractual designs or interest in contractual designs. They want a service and trying to tell them that you can't put a, an additional trip in they perceive you as the operator as being uncaring. So this static environment means fixed routes, times, frequencies, defined kilometers per trip. Uh, and it also is then perceived as a non-responsive to user need and requirements. Now, if you, if you think about the changes in the South African uh, process since democracy, we've had population growth, we've had Redensification, different densification in key areas, change in demographics, and evolving, changing business environment. We have got to be receptive to those changes. So contract designs are done. They're reviewed using consultants. The CSIR generally does oversight on that, but it stops there. There's no proper engagement further on the contract design, and impl implementations are very rarely executed. I've spoken about facilities not being managed. Uh, technological innovation and advances are lagging because of these conditions and the user experience is not ideal. The uncertainty, another word that always is bandied in any discussion with subsidy. Contract periods moved from month to month, then a bit to yearly. And I think at best it's been a three yearly extension. <clears throat> However, there's been very little or no progress across provinces in terms of the implementation of integrated transport plans. So, you know, that is a crucial backdrop for future and further contract design and implementation of any negotiated uh, contract, possible and or negotiated. Now, sitting with that, and Jack will perhaps help us, is uh, the delayed pro protected process in establishing a contracting authority or capacitating the contracting authority is not helping the situation. It's still uncertain and there's no idea how long. So uh, there's also a, a, a serious piece of uh, documentation that goes back to 1999 uh, with the tripartite Ed of, Eds of Agreement. It's entered into between the industry, the department and organized labor to secure the tenure of employment for the workforce. So any competitive tendering process must ensure that the successful bidder takes at least 75% of staff or the workforce at existing rates. It, it also makes provisions for an industry restructuring fund to be applicably managed to avoid mass retrenchments 
and uh, also to manage the process for stuff not taken on to be paid out. Over the last couple of years, the subsidy regime has been faced with a constant annual qualified report from our Auditor General. He cites many things that have been done over the years, which have become practice and long-standing processes, he deems them irregular. And this is especially critical because he cites the Public Finance Management Act in line with these irregular findings. So that's resulted in many legal challenges from operators and the department has often had to either reach settlement or, or the courts are found in favor of operators. But the industry took legal opinion uh, uh, through uh, on the relationship between the provisions of the Public Finance uh, Management Act, one of 99, and the Land, Land Transport Act, uh, using advocate Vim Fengo uh, SC, assisted by Isabel Goodman. And as I, I quote them directly there, if you read sections 41 and 46 of the Transport Act, it permits provincial departments to conclude negotiated contracts with bus operators. They also permit the departments in limited circumstances to procure, procure bus services from operators without going out to tender. Those negotiated contracts are regulated by the NLTA and are not rendered unlawful by the PFMA. So consequently, in their view, Payments made under the contracts do not amount to irregular expenditure. So now you have a national AG telling you it's irregular and we have a legal opinion saying we don't think it's irregular. It's not well positioned for that process to lead to good contracting conditions going forward unless there's good deliberation. There is a currently a court case before the courts in KZN. Judgment is uh, expected or set down for the first week of August. It has uh, elements of this aspect uh, attributed to it. So we will look forward to that. And constant uh, extension of contracts creates a bottleneck of administration in one of the government entities called public, uh, the PRI, uh, the provincial regulating le regulatory entity, which uh, provides the operator's license or the permits. If you put a term to it, all of your fleet, your permits all get extended for three years and you have thousands of buses and documents all expiring at the same time, which puts immense pressure on this entity. And very often they are unable to meet that requirement, creating delays and untenable situations because without the operating license and or the permit, operators are not legally operating. So if I tie all that back into the National Household Transport Survey, perceptions of the bus public transport uh, service, and the specifically I pulled out factors influencing households' choice of mode by, of travel by province and the bus service. So dissatisfaction with bus services by province summarizes the reasons for dis dissatisfaction for those who used it. And the top four attributes to, to elicit dissatisfaction, facilities, level of crowding, security, and the frequency of buses. Okay. Yes, it's a very snapshot view, but it threads into all the issues I've raised. So between 2013 and 2020, it is the same type of dissatisfaction and it correlates. So having created all that perceptions and a negative what are the recommendations? What do we need to talk about? Okay, uh, without a doubt, it has to be a collaborative partnership between stakeholders. And by that, I don't, just don't mean the operators or the contract holders and bidders and government. It's the consultants, it's our Center for Scientific uh, Research, CSIR, the SMME components, the people that want to be in the space, business, our community and labor. Everybody needs to contribute towards design, sustainability, and implementation. Talking about implementation, integrated transport plans, it's taking far long to get to the decision, and it's impacting directly on the process and outcomes of progress uh, on contract negotiations and implementations. Linked to that is the formalization and appointment of contracting authorities. 
uh, the legislation is there, we need to implement it. I think through this process, critically, we need to get out of an uncertain phase towards a certain phase. Certain about what we want to do, who's going to do it, and by when it must be done. And uh, for that, start a process of negotiation with the existing operators. Resident is all the information and data. Conclude contract designs, engage all stakeholders, and implement legislation. And a dialogue should go on, uh, uh, you know, personally from an industry point of view, the disconnect between tiers of government needs to be eradicated. We need decisive accountability at all levels. We need capacity at all levels. And we need to use the industry bodies uh, as central focus for communications and engagement. Transformation is critical. In a country like ours, you can't take decisions and strategize without ensuring transformation. And I think there's a need to have the discussion and use the process to facilitate shift in ownership demographics to get the uh, representation and buy-in. It's imperative that the, con the inclusion of SMME is in from the start. You need to build solid skills transfer for future planning. And one of the things we greatly lack is gender parity, uh, ensuring more women uh, become part of the transport sphere, more than just a lip service uh, to that issue. And then whenever we talk to policy change, make it inclusive and detailed. So coming up uh, and the industry is engaging critically with government now on the proposed subsidy policy changes. Jack mentioned that. There's an integrated ticketing system and account-based fair collections process, uh, single platform envisaged alternative energy vehicles Jackie spoke about and two major legislative issues being implemented on the on the 1st of July, ARTO and uh, the Poppy Act. Okay. And on a very, I think, tail end point of uh, decision making, something we don't do well at all. Uh, we do not have a data set with integrity that we can talk to. It's, it's always riddled, it's always got gaps. Uh, so we need to implement secure data collection systems, initiate uh, the integrity protocols and build a history that contracting authorities now has got solid basis for proper design planning and implementation of integration. So getting towards the end, uh, The job's not nearly done, it's not nearly begun, so we are stuck and, and uh, we need to get traction. But uh, you all know the bus and culture industry plays a large role in mobility. But uh, you know the, the NLTA of 2009 set out, amongst others, the requirements for an integrated transport system with shared ticketing and infrastructure to ensure that a uh, flexible and ease of access mobility environment is available or achieved. Now we're well over a decade and a very little progress in, in achieving outcomes uh, desired through the NLTA. And in some cases we've regressed. So it is crucial that the role of public transport in the current economy and the contribution that it can make towards uh, down the line in the economy is seen integral to the social construct. And the importance of quality public transport service delivery demands that all of us, all of us today, everybody who can, ensures that we make progress in the interest and benefit of all our stakeholders. I hope I've given you food for thought, uh, uh, panel, and uh, all the attendees. Uh, thank you, Ari, for having us and uh, uh, to the Transport Forum, the UJ the sponsors and uh, all of you attending today for allowing Saboa to share on behalf of the industry, some of the critical concerns and challenges around public transport contracts. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Basil. We're learning so much from you and clearly collaboration is so important and they ask you to operate and not be able to make money. There won't be, there won't be any transport and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the public will not benefit from such a situation. Thank you very much for your collaborative support. We really appreciate that.
Um, for those that's just joined this session, there's quite a number of people on YouTube as well as joined this session in the meantime. Uh, we, we had Mr. Jack and Amaba presenting and there was a technical challenge. So we asked Jack to, to sort out a challenge and we had Basil presenting and now kindly we can get Jack and Amaba back on again, Jack, if you can continue your presentation, we'll really appreciate that. Thank you, Jack. Um, thank you, Harry. Um, if I may comment, I think uh, there's not enough time um, to to say what we want to say on this because it's a very, very difficult um, issue. Uh, calendar, let me just see transfers. Jack, you don't have to rush. We have uh, had quite a long lunch time, so we can, you know, go into the lunch time as well. So you're welcome to to take your time and do your presentation. Um, let me just see what is happening here. It seems like the, the glitches don't want to leave me. There we go, Jack. Um, one, you want me to share your presentation on your behalf? Wait, let me give you one more chance. Yeah, that is. Just want to go down there. Can you see this? No, Jack. No, then you'll have to share it from your side. Let's do that. All right, the, um, next slide. Right, um, <clears throat> hearing what, what the previous speaker said, um, I think this is the approach that we're going to have on the contract design. Customer-centric, uh, target to achieve a public transport, the integrated public transport system. I lost you again. Sorry, Jack, I'll fix it now. Um, then again, and I think this is this is absolutely true. Developing big data-driven solutions, using the fourth industrial revolution, um, big data, transport modeling, um, ensure scientifically based decision making. This has been lacking for years um, within legislative and policy framework within the Act, but then um, the sixth administration of the province, um, the battle cry for those five years is growing Gauteng together. 2030 through sustainable smart mobility. Next slide. Um, just um, wait, just go one back, Harry. Uh, transport professionals have always had a challenge in addressing mobility. What has changed? 
and this is really the the five unavoidable big challenges that that the world is facing um that will impact on the future sustainability of life on earth these are globalization where we have 70 75 percent of the population living in um, city condomines the environment pollution and greenhouse gases the fourth industrial revolution workforce challenges you know we have 40 plus percent unemployed when they come back the work as the, the the workforce requirements would have changed so how are we going to take them into an industry that they don't know that they haven't been trained for and then of course the impact of COVID 19. next slide so what is smart mobility uh, vehicle technology new types of vehicle powered by alternative fuels electric mobility optimized power trains uh, reaching new levels of car safety vehicle fuel efficiency autonomous driving vehicles vehicle dynamic control and expanding on the in-car system for helping drivers now this again the bus industry all of that is going to be massively impacted on by, by this I, um, ITS intelligent transport systems connected cars cooperative adaptive cruise control intelligent traffic management and platooning of trucks next one the third thing is data real-time passenger travelers information personalized travel assistance logistic plannings ID system matching supply and demand for mobility big data solutions often in relation to smart city developments and security architecture for uh, generated traffic data and new mobility services optimal utilization of the existing vehicle and truck capacity ride sharing car sharing new bike system and non-motorized transport um, integration of mobility modes using smartphones for facilitating mobility demand and ticketing on demand ride services use of individual cars as public transport and for order and individual solutions integrating in dynamic transport control system and this is on the on the horizon within the next 10 years um, but then again south africa will always have layers of of additional requirements we have to have socially sustainable um, smart mobility so the impact of transport activities but not threaten long-term ecological sustainability a basic transport needs should be satisfied affordability of mobility is the core issue in intra-generational transport equity um, should be promoted access to transport should not vary systematically uh, across population groups and intergenerational transport equity should be promoted Next one. Um, so we have to look at affordability of mobility share of the household net income accessibility of key services social equity meaning equal entrance to mobility health conditions for household air quality noise and amenities um, when they when they built the highway network in in, in the interstate network in america um, the roads were always um, rooted through poor communities so noise and pollution was was then given as a fact to to the poorer communities safety and security social um, cohesion related to the sustainability of the in the of environmental section and working conditions of the next one um, it has to be data centric big data allows for the decision to be based on travel demand management modeling allocation of permits and permissions, determining OPEX and CAPEX priorities, um, determining enforcement and monitoring process, funding requirements. Um, we, we've had three reports released. We have the Competition Commission's report on land-based public transport. We have the National Household Travel Survey. We have the Provincial Cotec Provincial Household Travel Survey. And then knowledge management to see whether we can um, we have a knowledge management center within within the transport world. This is just the fundamentals. You have on the OPEX, you have the cost of providing the service, you have a willingness or ability to pay on the other side, and to make it balance is is help or subsidy. The base infrastructure, uh, the CAPEX side is usually supplied by, by government. The cost control um, of the base infrastructure is uh, or the cost control of the, the providing the service. 
is controlled through ensuring efficiency, open competition, and then the subsidy is do we award the subsidy to the operator or the commuter? And this is a whole argument on itself. Next. Um, again, a holistic approach, consultation and communication with all role players and stakeholders. This is key. Um, it's been a, a, a plea from, from the bus industry to say, bring us on board. Let's look at the contracts. Let's look, look, look at what is the con uh, conditions. Um, the Competition Commission says, look for new money. Use it by principle. Has to be enforced. That means we will have to talk about the ETOLs and not other party when they say we're going to scrap the ETOLs because the ETOLs was used to build phase one of the Gauteng Freeway Improvement Plan. There's still a phase two and a phase three. And if we don't have funding, we're never going to build. Risk management, again, risk identification, risk quantification, risk allocation to the party is suited and and then risk mitigation. And then management of road-based freight because they use the same road space. Uh, must be aligned to our strategic transport plan. And this transport plan uh, must consider future developments in the transport sector for a five to 15 year period. And uh, it must take on board the, the, the integrated transport plans of the, the various municipalities. Next one. Um, then we, out of that, we develop an integrated implementation plan. And what is quite interesting here is that we have to ensure um, the integration of public transport. We have to identify uh, the procurement of public transport services over the five year period, what action should be taken. But then there's an infrastructure investment program. And this will be all subsidies being paid um, to public transport will come into a infrastructure investment fund. And at the moment, according to the um, Competition Commission, there's 37 billion rand being paid per year to public transport in the country. We will get about half of that. So we will get about um, 17, 18 billion rand that will go into that, that fund. Next one. Um, tag types of contract. Let's just look at the types of contract that we have. Um, this is just a classification, and uh, you can look at it later. Next one, um, next slide, is that we will be looking at contracts, operation and maintenance contracts, new infrastructure, off-budget funding, permits and permissions, and enforcement. And when we combine operations, maintenance, new infrastructure, off-budget, uh, it becomes part of the PPP type contracts. So these are the contracts that we will have to go into. Next one. Um, on the operations and maintenance, how do you how do you measure success? And it's really to look at efficiency and effectiveness of the system. Um, and if the efficiency goes down, the fare box revenue goes down, and you have to increase the subsidy portion. Um, if, it, if you cannot increase the subsidy, then the system degrades, the ridership reduces, and the downward spiral begins. And we've seen it with Metro. People are forced to other less efficient modes of transport, resulting in congestion, loss of productivity. Next slide. This is out of the National Arsenal Travel Survey. I think this is quite interesting. According to them, we have 59 million people and 41.7 uh, million people uh, make trips per day. Now, walking is 41%. And, and we will see when, when, we, when we talk about um, walking with the work trips. Private car use 25%, and public transport is only 30%, 29.9% of, of the trips made in South Africa. Now we get to the minibus taxis. Of all the trips, 83% is done by minibus taxis, 14.6% by buses, and you can see trains are just going into, into, into the ground, only 2.4%. So if you work it backwards, you can see many bus taxis transport 25.7% of all trips in South Africa. They will never quote you that number, but that's the number. That's the real number of the trips. The next slide. This is even more interesting. This is work trips. So we have 16.6 .6 million work trips per day. Um, walking 
And this is walking all the way from the home to, to work, 20%, private car use, 43%, public transport, 35%. This is where the problem, <coughs> the problem lies, is that our share of public transport is 35%, and you know in Europe that is 70, 80%, and in the Far East, it's uh, 80 to 90% public transport use. But now the interesting thing is, you see in red, is the 2013 survey. So the, the minibus taxis in 2013 transported 67% um, of, the, of the workers. That's jumped up to 80%. The buses transported 19.5%. That's reduced to 16.6%. And the trains transported 12.9%. And that's reduced to 3%. <laughs> the next slide is the most worrying slide. This is the cost the monthly cost of transport to work by the main mode of transport. You can see the trains, the cost has gone up from 371 rand per month per passenger from 2013 to 581 rand to 2020. The buses, you can see the cost has gone from um, 472 rand to 745 rand. But the taxis, the average monthly cost of the taxis have gone from 515 rand per month to 960 rand per month, which means now if, we, if we're chasing the people, the train is, is, is going down in, in, in ridership, we're chasing the people to the train, to the taxis, and the taxis, so the, the poorest of the poor, their monthly average cost of transport <coughs> has gone from 581 to 960 rand, which is a 65% increase. The other interesting thing is that if I take the taxis uh, in Gauteng, they, they turn around 12.279 billion rand per month in Gauteng. <coughs> so it's a very big um, industry. Next slide. Um, so if we look at the operations and maintenance, we look at it through um, through efficiency and an integrated system. Next slide. Um, we have a centralized setting of priorities for CapEx, a central point of receipt for public transport subsidies, and a centralized branding and marketing. So this is all within the transport authority. And uh, contracts could uh, be either a a bill of quantity contract or a memorandum of understanding between TAG and the local authorities. The next one. New infrastructure, normal bill of quantities tender, general conditions of contract, standard conditions of contract, standard specification, and special legislative policy requirements. Now, the standard condition of contract and the standard specification must be fixed and it must be known by the, by the, the, the people who are going to tender. Project specific is the bill of quantities, special conditions of contract and proof of contract plans. It's an input spec. The contractors supply the pre designed services or infrastructure, and it's only involved in up to one year of retention after completion. And so the contractor is not involved in the life cycle of the project. Next slide off budget, user pay principle, ETOL's issue must be resolved and it could form part of a PPP type contract. Next one. Competition Commission. Um, this is on permits and permissions on pre. Um, they say that the function should be done by the Transport Authority. So you will see, if you read the Competition Commission, if something is wrong, then they say give it to the Transport Authority. So uh, I will have a whole bucket full of things that are not working. Next slide. Um, enforcement, Competition Commission, say in their market inquiry into land-based public passenger transport sector, recommends that there should be an enforcement section established to ensure public transport safety and adhere to the conditions of the permit and permissions awarded by the PRE. Um, this will initially be achieved through the signing of a memorandum of understanding between TAG and the provincial and local authorities' police services and then the creation of a public transport inspectorate within TAG. That decision will be taken later. Next. 
um, PPP type contracts. Um, <coughs> this will be done in terms of the um, Treasury Regulation um, number 16 of the PFMA, and uh, there would be transaction advisors, secondary consultants. Next, next, uh, next slide. Um, and in the Competition Commission's inquiry into, market, into the market, they recommend that PPP type projects must be considered by Treasury to augment the current transfer budget. <coughs> Next slide. All right, so if one looks at contract design, this is just a little bit more, is you identify the need, prioritize, you define what you need to deliver, you secure the funding, you're going to prepare bid documents, Go through a competitive process to receive bids, you will appoint a bidder you, to provide the service within scope, budget, and time. You monitor delivery as specified and you certify payment. So this becomes a little bit more complicated, but then next slide. You then, in this, you have legal requirements, the legal requirements of, of BE and empowerment and women in construction and people with disability. And then you have another level where there are pol policy directives, which says, for instance, 30% of the contract amount to local labor. <coughs> so when a contractor comes onto the site, he puts up a board and he says, this contract's been awarded to Martin Roberts. Uh, the contract amount is 600 million. Um, they, when, when the contract comes onto site, uh, the local, the local, um, labor market has organized itself and says, fine, we're getting 30% of the 600 million rand, so we want 180 million rand for labor. This is a total disruption and it's causing major problems. But then we've even put in another level, and this is long-term strategic goals, and there's things like open tender process. And uh, these different levels are making the contract, which in the beginning said it's a, it's a Agreement between two parties to deliver the service. Now it becomes quite complicated. Next slide. Um, and I've just put this in to show, as an example, the subsidized bus contracts. So post 1994, Ketcha Gordon and Mark said, we must fix it. But what do we fix? We fix A, we develop a white paper on policy and, and uh, develop the legislation. B, we change existing contract form to open market. C, we transform the bus industry internally. E, uh, I've got a D there. E, we bring in new entrants into the industry externally. F, we address areas not serviced in the previous regime to expand the current system. G, we consult with labor unions on their requirements and needs. H, it must form part of the integrated transport plan. And I, we must secure sustainable funding. So instead of saying we would like to change this step by step, <coughs> Sorry, we set ourselves the goal to do all of this immediately. And because of that, we're now in 2021, um, which is 27 years later, and we still haven't achieved that. And uh, I have next slide, please. This is the same. Again, just push it again. This is we'll fix it. Push it again. Next slide. Right. Sorry, just go back. This is the, the same, what Jackie showed. This is a contract that was given out. And the bottom line is there was 37.7 million rand per year available. And the tender amount was 110 million, um, 86 million, 79 million, 91 million, 95 million. So there is a total disjunction between what the money is available and what the cost is if you add all these things together. And uh, so the contract was cancelled. But if you if you go out, <coughs> you can actually do what you what you propose to do. You can do a third of that with the money that you have, a third or or a half of that. Next slide. <coughs> um, so standardization of contracts, documents and process must be transparent, open tender process probably ordered, process streamlined, um, process encapsulated in those plans. Next one. So 
it just says yeah everything even if you're on the right track you will get run over if you just sit there but next slide next slide um no you yeah, one back one back at it there always seems impossible until no, we, we, one one forward again Mary. Guys, it seems that we lost Jack for the moment again. Um, I'll phone him and ask him to get online. Uh, but uh, I'll be back with you in a second. Thank you. All right, ladies and gents, I've just spoken to Jack. Um, he confirmed he was actually at the end of his presentation. He's busy joining the session again. But what we're going to do now, and uh, let me just put the screen share on here that we can see what's happening. All right, so everyone, please kindly, our panelists to switch on their cameras, unmute themselves so that I can bring them into the panel. Um, but guys, we've got now at the start of this panel discussion, we've got the exciting little competition uh, hosted by Huawei. Tommy, you're welcome to unmute yourself and uh, take us through the, the little competition uh, sponsored by Huawei. Okay, thank you, Ari. Um, I can post a question on onto the chat room and the first three people that respond correctly to that uh, will win the first three speakers and there's the question what is the abbreviation gta stands for there's the first one kathy There's a second one. There's a third one. Okay, so we got our three three winners on that side. Thank you very much. We will come into contact with your people and uh, deliver your uh, speakers to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Harry. Congratulations to the winners and thank you for Huawei for sponsoring this. It's exciting. Uh, so we'll have the same in the next panel discussion. <laughs> yes. Ladies and gents, okay, we've got two of our panelists uh, in the panel. I don't know if Prof. Jackie Walter Walters wants to join. Um, there we go. There's Prof. I'm here, Harry. I'm here, Harry. Thank you, Prof. You're in, you're in the panel. So at the moment, Jack joins. He's busy joining again. Then I'll bring Jack in as well. So, ladies and gents, um, uh, let's let's uh, let's have a look and. Uh, at the, at the participants box, you're welcome to raise your hand in the participants box and we can recognize you there uh, if you want to ask a question there. And, uh, and then also you're welcome to post a question in the chat room and we will try and see in the chat room, um, you know, what questions have been asked. I see Prof. Uh, David Enschler made a few nice comments there um, and uh, also some food for thought. Um, you see, uh, Prof. Hensha said, I don't know if Prof. Hensha wants to join the panel discussion. He's welcome to switch on his camera if he perhaps wants to join. That will be great. But he says the public transport supply chain is increasingly changing 
with risks and controls being, sp being spread wide and increasingly wide, wide as operating. Big fine ponds, but yes, to have resources not. that particularly is incredible. And the first thing that's the This is the point of the life plan. Right? Yeah, you can be an idea. Uh, yes. Prof, Prof, you're, you're online. Please, you know. <laughs> right, so right. critical. <laughs> how, how are you? Good to hear you. Thank you, Prof. Welcome to the panel discussion. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. What's going on here? We've been looking at your comments in the, in the chat room there. The public transport supply chain is increasingly changing with risk and controls being spread wide, increasingly away from the bus operator. Is this good or not? Crucial issue to look at and to ensure the stakeholders in supply chain become more involved in the partnership. Maybe uh, you want to elaborate a little bit on that or one of the panelists perhaps? Sorry, I, I've lost the sound. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. What, what, sorry, what is it you want me to elaborate on? I, now the sound's no, back, sorry. The public transport supply chain is increasingly changing. Oh, yes, oh. sure. Um, what, what we're noticing in many countries is that the um, w w with intelligent transport systems and the move to zero emission buses, for example, and um, buses essentially being maintained through the suppliers, through the um, computerized systems that they have on board, et cetera. A, a pretty big question that's now being asked is what role in the future will the actual bus operator have um, as distinct from government and from the suppliers, et cetera. Uh, and, and I think this is why we're seeing a move to management contracts and away from uh, gross or net cost contracts, because it's really taking a lot of control out of the bus operator's hands and even the other day, someone said to me that when we have autonomous buses, there's not much left for the operator to actually um, manage or control apart from keeping the uh, buses timetabled and keeping the passengers happy. So th this is a pretty big issue. Now, I don't know to what extent it applies in South Africa. Jack talked a lot about all the new technologies, but it does seem to me in South Africa, you've got far bigger issues than worrying about that. Um, so my question was, if you want to be specific, um, in a number of places around the world, we, we're all about zero emission buses these days. And even in Australia, we're told we've got to turn the, the contracted fleet over in, in eight years to zero emission buses. And we know that that's a big, big challenge. And I think bus operators, most of them have no clue as to what they should be doing to achieve that. And this is why I think that ultimately government's going to take control of that process and start to um, even do things like uh, want to own the depots and things like that. So it's a broad question as to whether this is something that South Africa's thinking about because it's become so dominant, the decarbonisation of the bus industry in Europe, in the USA and in Australia. And I'm just wondering... Where is this on the South African agenda? Thank you, Prof. Encha. Just for the audience, Prof. Encha is talking to us from Australia. Um, Very so maybe Prof. Jackie and, and Andrea, maybe you can comment. Thank you, Andrea. Right. Just, just uh, the, the point from, from Europe, of course, the zero emission is very, very important. What is, what is so many times uh, in terms of managing the contractor also with the supplier, that uh, it's not easy at all in terms of the KPI that you want to fix, uh, uh, the, you know, the cost uh, per vehicle kilometer and so on. So many times private uh, also have a role in terms of having very, very good experience in terms of how to make the contract with also the supplier that can also manage the maintenance. More and more, as you totally right, uh, we saw that the, the external maintenance, the maintenance is, made, is outsourced more and more in many contracts, uh, not only in the, in the bus, but also in the train industry. What I saw that uh, is not easy at all, if you have no experience as a public transport operator, as a rail commuter operator, uh, how to make this kind of contract. So I, I continue to see a role in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, to be very, very good in defining all the KPI that is needed as a public transport operator or the rail, uh, rail uh, 
rail operator just at this point. But I completely agree that uh, it's changing and technology is coming, the autonomous bus is coming and so on. And so it's, it's really needed also a quick change of regulation that uh, has to think about these uh, big changes in technology and the needs and so on. Thank you, Professor. I think um, just to answer David's question, I think South Africa is very much aware of, you know, it's, it's, the country's also signed these international agreements on lowering carbon emissions and so on. Um, and certainly it's it's moving in the right direction, but not, a, not much work is being done at present around um, greening uh, public transport, uh, excepting maybe uh, the, on the rail side, new rolling stock being built and uh, put into operation where those lines are operational at this point in time. But in the bus industry, you know, um, we haven't seen any real move. Uh, what we've seen in some of the BRTs is that um, the, the specifications of those BRT buses uh, was more more around Euro 5, Euro 6 type engines to get those emissions lower than the Euro, uh, Euro 2 and 3 and 4 type engines that we have in those buses. But everything's still diesel. Um, I'm aware of the fact that um, our Minister of Trade and Industry, Minister Patel, is uh, busy with an initiative in the motor car industry because by 2030, many of the uh, vehicles that's being sold into Europe you know, being exported from South Africa will uh, have to have electric vehicles, electric traction, or hybrid, and so on. And that's not the case. All the vehicles that we're exporting now are, are, are petrol and diesel engine vehicles. So the industry itself has no problem in experimenting or introducing green green uh, buses, electric buses or hybrid buses, uh, CNG and so on. But we expect those specifications to be written into the contracts, and then the operator would then respond accordingly in terms of you know what the cost would be based on the duration of the contract and so on. So the industry has no problem in dealing with it as long as the government specifies that in these contracts. Uh, we also foresee that there may be some form of change in terms of how these services are managed. Uh, we would expect that, for instance, on the green buses, that's going to be much more expensive two, three times more expensive than, than say, diesel bus, uh, electric buses being much more expensive, that the contract duration will have to be changed to a longer term to allow for the proper write-off of that asset over its useful life. So we foresee changes in the contracting regime coming forward. For, for um, On top of that, you know, the questions that operators are asking South Africa when discussing this issue, we had, we had a seminar a while ago around this, is who pays for the infrastructure, charging stations, who owns that, and so on. Um, but at, at this point in time, and if electric buses, I think one of the big issues that we have is stability of electricity supply. Uh, we have a tremendous undersupply of electricity and load shedding uh, this week has been going on every day. You know, and that's not conducive towards uh, the charging of bus, electric bus batteries and so on. So um, short, short answers, the industry is happy to consider it, but the, there will have to be many more negotiations with government and the contracting authorities now to deal with this, how to fund this, the duration of the contract, but the industry is ready to respond. I can maybe just make one short uh, um, note here. In Cape Town, the Golden Arrow is actually operating a few of these electric buses that by default are operating through some um, failure of a previous contract and they're busy experimenting with this. And, and they will have research results, say, within a year uh, to do a comparative analysis of electric buses versus diesel in their operation. Uh, it's not that they didn't specify the vehicles uh, to specify for something else, but certainly we'll have some indication of how these vehicles are performing in those operating conditions there. And that once again says that the operators are prepared to look at this, but the contract must specify that, and we have to do look at some of the conditions of these contracts going forward. I, yes, if I could just agree with Jackie, but I think we must remind ourselves that any evidence from these trials, which might be the one bus, two buses, doesn't necessarily mean that we've identified the transition risk when we scale up to multiple uh, vehicles. And I think this is a big issue at the moment. And I, it's just a warning that um, in many countries, I don't think operators are prepared to enter into any form of tendered contract um, under great uncertainty about 
uh, de depot requirements and bus replacement and yeah. and who's going to buy the residual value of the diesel buses yeah. so so once again um, I'm pushing very strongly that in transition you should be having a negotiated arrangement uh, until such times as the risk allocation is absolutely clear and uh, I fully agree with you I think um... I'm not saying that what's going on in Cape Town is going to be a proxy for the entire country. It's just that these buses fell into the company's laps, so to speak, in inverted commas, and they're not running them. So they want, because they've always wanted to do some on the road experience, get some on the road experience of these buses, right? Operate and so on. So certainly, you know, if you look at, if you look at the longer term, the headlines, South Africa will also be drawing on experience of other bus operators internationally. Uh, on hybrid buses, hybrid technology, electric buses, and so on, to inform its policy view around this. So it won't, it won't depend on what's going on in Cape Town. I think it's just that it was an opportunity the company couldn't let go, and they're operating these buses. And I think um, uh, it will be interesting to see the results, even, even though it may be a, short, a small scale, small scale result. Yeah, well, could I suggest we don't talk about zero emission buses, but zero tailpipe emission buses? Because the um, the actual energy source to to charge the buses per kilowatt hour is actually a source of CO two, and made worse, of course, uh, if in fact it's linked to coal fired power stations. Um, how, how is the electricity generated in South Africa? Where does it come from? Well, it's, it's about ninety. I would say about 90, 92, 93 percent coal, then nuclear, and clean energy, wind power, solar power, and so on. About five percent down there but the majority is, is still fired so yeah uh, it's a very interesting topic and i i just think we need to have it on the agenda because uh, there'll be a point in time when we, ma many countries will not have much of a choice it's i mean you might in 20 years time you might find the major manufacturers are only willing to sell you electric buses or hydrogen buses That may be so, though, uh, yeah, if I may, came in. I think we are positioning the, the discussion. It's pretty much entry level at this point because we've got, again, crafting of documents, crafting of policies. But the one thing we know for sure, it is cost prohibitive to even start doing research, undertake any studies. So I, I think our first task, and, and that's where we're trying to position it, we had a session on the 8th of April that explored the introduction of alternative energy vehicles, not just necessarily uh, electric vehicles. But I see the minister's one step ahead of us. He's, he's positioning autonomous vehicles as a framework. And, you know, we, we need to take that first step. But there is a framework. And I think what we need to do is ensure one of the issues I spoke to is intergovernmental departments need to align. Department of Trade and Industry that's talking about promoting alternative energy vehicles and transport and the industry all need to be in the same space when we take that first step. Uh, right now, uh, we're looking forward. Anything Golden Arrow does is something we've never had before. So we're looking forward to that. But all of the comments noted, I think uh, our, our challenge is to understand what we want to do and everybody take the first step together, not just yeah, enterprise writes the policy, Treasury has no modeling or even a casting of a model that says, if we project, what does the model tells us? Uh, operators uh, need access to finance. Uh, you know, our finance house is going to take that risk in the step with them. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good challenge to have and we support it as an industry, but a lot of groundwork still to be done in the planning stage of that first step. Thanks, Thank, you, Basil. Thank you, Basil. There's a question from YouTube here. Uh, let's, let's take this as the last question and then we can have closing remarks from the panelists. But here's the question, uh, Richard Malinga is asking, any examples of commuter train services that are not in any form of subsidy, for example, profitable in its own standing? No, <laughs> we, we have uh, in terms of you have the case of Japan, where you have a vertical integration, integrated system that is completely different. 
in that case, you have from the high, for example, JRE, that is uh, the biggest one, uh, as a uh, managing uh, the infrastructure, the high speed service, and the commuter rail. So in that case, the state didn't pay for the commuter rail, but they have a very cross subsidization from the high speed rail services, so the benefits that you have from commercial services to the commuter rail. The commuter rail, they are losing money, but it's cross subsidized internally by the same company. But of course, it's not easy to reply this kind of business model all around the world. It's a very specific of Japan, where also a part of the debt, historic debt of JR, uh, Japan Railways, was paid in the 80s by the government. So it's quite complex. About some uh, um, regional service, <laughs> in Italy, we call also some regional service some service that is uh, in the high-speed rail. Uh, for example, I give you some example. Milan to Turin is 145 kilometers, but it's 45 minutes by train because that's high speed. Or Milan to Reggio Emilia, that is 140 kilometers and is 40 minutes by train. In that case, you have a commercial service. Uh, it's a different uh, sort of regional service, but it's a sort of commercial service for a sort of commuter rail for 35, 40 minutes, but it's high speed rail. So in that case, the operator didn't receive a money subsidies for that, but it's a quite specific business case that I think also that case couldn't be replied in, uh, in other places. It's very, very complex to be a copy, uh, copy and paste to other cases. So, and other regional service uh, about commuter rail I was thinking about Spain, they receive money, France, they receive money. Uh, UK, you have a franchisee system. Normally, many of these franchisees, they receive money, but not all the franchisee system receive money. So some line probably is uh, profitable. So, but in general, in Germany, they receive money. If you go to uh, South Korea, because I teach also there, they receive money for commuter rail. So it's not so easy. What is needed? is really a good tendering for a good allocation of that money and that really competition for uh, in terms of for that market. If, can I just make one comment briefly? I mean, we are talking about whatever you do with a substitute should be efficient and that's a problem. But the Japanese one is very interesting because in fact, it's not just cross subsidy between high speed rail and commuter. It's also funding that's coming from their ownership of hotels and retail outlets right near the stations. And in fact, they are a multi-service organization, not just a transport company. And I think that's a really important issue because increasingly, as we move into other areas like mobility as a service, um, we find that we've got to stop talking about multimodality and talk about multi-service. Because if government is not gonna to continue to throw money at transport, I think it's gotta come from non-transport agencies, and there may be opportunities here for both parties to gain without keep draining the, the coffers of government. Yes, just, and it's very true. And the same is in Hong Kong with MTR uh, that manage the, is uh, managing the subway system and so on, uh, the public transport operator, where the majority of the majority, around 27% of the revenue is coming from real estate and from other kind of activities. So we have these two cases but it's completely different. Maybe it's very easy to be applied in, uh, I don't know, in Kuwait. I remember that I, I spoke with the Public Transport Authority in Kuwait where you build totally new zones that could be developed thanks also to the subway system and so on. It's not easy, for example, to implement in Europe where you have uh, no space to build a new, new building, new skyscraper yeah. on the historic city of uh, Rome and so on. So really depending on the city, really depending on the structure of the city and the, the business model, it's very complex to copy. That's absolutely right. And in Sydney, with the new metro, uh, they put out to tender before they actually started um, for uh, for privileged access to the stations in terms of um, development. So the value capture argument, and that's helping to fund the railways. Worse than coming here. Thank you very much, panelists. Um, can we now ask for closing remarks? If we can start with Basil, and then we go to Prof. Andrea, and then to Prof. Encher, and then to, to Jack. Uh, so, Basil, closing remarks from your side, perhaps? Yeah, thanks, Eric. And, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's clear that, uh, you know, if, we, uh, if I certainly listen to, to Jack, 
and and the comments that are coming out, we are we are closer than we think. It's sometimes the emotive emotive sentiments that make us believe that there are different agendas. But certainly, the industry uh, to encapsulate, uh, you know, in one word, certainty. The industry is looking for certainty. With certainty comes good decision making, good investment, good long term commitments from all stakeholders. Uh, and, and I think uh, there are op opportunities in all these challenges. And, and I'm sure Jack will give some robust debate to taking a triple P type initiative into public transport, uh, private sector, public sector. There's ways of overcoming fiscal constraints. Uh, we can't keep on using fiscal constraints for the next decade and remain in the same static uh, uh, environment. But yeah, certainty will promote the development of local content will create a uh, secure tenure for employment where we can, whilst we innovate, whilst we integrate, it will, re it will eradicate certain job functions and specifications, but create other job opportunities and technological advancements. So, but in a contract design and contract certainty will certainly make us all start taking our focus away from why, why, why to what, what, what we need to do. Thanks for the opportunity, Harry. Thank you, Basil. Some closing remarks from Prof. Andrea. Very, very quick. So certainly, of course, uh, when it was with private, it's needed. Uh, regulation is, uh, is a key element, as, as you saw. And uh, what is very, very complex is to, to understand how in the public funds will could change the finance. Uh, all around the world, so it's not just South Africa, but as you explain, how to increase the finance in the element. For example, there's uh, in the station, you know, advertising, um, to put the name of something uh, in the station, for example, here we have uh, some uh, station that is named uh, with, uh, with the name of, uh, of uh, TV player and so on. So it, it's very interesting how to increase the financing in the sector. And how to regulate then this financing? Because uh, as you saw, there's uh, in every part of the world we have lack of financing, and it's very very complex. Uh, also in this period after COVID, how to restart the business? So very very quick now. Indeed, very complex. Thank you, sir, Prof. Andrea, uh, Prof. David. Yes, thank thank. Um, I was just thinking what I might say, and I want to put it into a South African context. And with my many visits over the years, and I'm just looking forward to coming back one of these days when we can, I do think the, the, the great challenge you have there, um, apart from transparency, is education and the skills of the people in this sector. And I honestly believe that if you can get better educated and skilled people into this industry, then I think you'll make better decisions and you, you will make better use of the scarce, uh, the scarce dollar. It, it is... It, even though you've got big issues with safety and security, I do think you need better leadership and management in this sector to, to make sure that we're not wasting money in areas which are not necessarily uh, benefiting users. Thank you, Prof. David. I really appreciate that. Um, Jack, some closing comment. Yeah, I, I wanted to say three things, but now I'm going to say four things. I, I want to add on to what uh, David has said, we need skills and we need education, but we need people that have a long-term view on, on transport. We, we have a, a, a thing in South Africa where the ministers get changed quite often. Um, you know, we have a five-year cycle, but in the middle of the five-year cycle, they also change the ministers, which is fine, but they can't change the, the tech technocrats. And in our country, when the minister leaves, the technocrat leaves with him. So, so the longest vision that you have in transport, yeah, could be two years, and that doesn't work. So you need this, you need this institutional knowledge. The three things I'd like to say is, you know, the BRT in our country, um, if you have nothing to do tonight, just read the Competition Commission's report, 300 pages. They are very critical on, on, on the BRT, on the, on the business model that was, that was used. And they actually asking for a commission of inquiry to find out. Now, one of the things that the BRT did wrong, you know, um, every time I look at the TV, there's a minister or a, or a mayor 
jumping in a in a plane going to Italy or to 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 uh, the UK or to the Far East to buy new buses. So we ended up buying BRT buses all over the world. There should have been a rule that says there's one factory that makes buses in South Africa. Your choice is it could be a red bus or a green bus or a yellow bus, but that's the choice. Like they didn't for the people. So so we 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 have spread, we've actually created jobs, created knowledge in other countries with, with the BRT, with the 12 BRT that we've done. The next thing is, you know, the bus industry in our country, we've heard it several times today, uh, is really on its knees. It it has a, a very aged fleet. It has to recapitalize and there has to there has to new people have to come into into the market. Now we have to take it. Uh, uh, make a stand on these new technology buses. Because if we now recapitalize based on the old technology, within three or four or five years, we'll have international experts coming here saying, but who is the, the, who is the monkey that said buy the old buses? You know, there's new buses on the road. So we, we have no choice but to go to the new technology. But if we don't want to do the same mistake that we did with the buses, uh, with the BRT buses, is that we have a hydrogen technology in our country. We have a platinum industry that will create millions of jobs if we keep sticking to the hydrogen. So I would like somebody higher to say, we have new technology in buses, we have a hydrogen bus and start doing it. I agree that government can't then just move the risk onto, onto the private sector. The private sector, the government must be willing to put its mouth, money where its mouth is and say, we'll take some of the risk. But but I'm, I'm really saying we, we, we have to um, look on the new technology and support the South African industry. The last thing is the Department of Transport is developing a subsidy policy. If anybody in this room, you must please write to the department and say, is there a committee? Can we be on it? Can we help you? Because once that's done, we're going to be really stuck to that policy for the next 20 or 30 years. So please, the, the subsidy policy will have an impact on everything we do. We have to influence that. We have to say, let, let's do it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, yes, let, let's really collaborate and hear what Jack is saying. Join those committees. It's so important to have your input. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, our host, Prof. Jackie, some closing remarks for this session. Thank you, Elia. <laughs> all the comments after uh, but I think it's very important that, that the authority or government does not see the private sector as an enemy. It's always this view of us versus them, you know, and big business and so on. And I really think collaboration between the private sector and government is really important around the future of the public transport industry. And it's we also talked about the policy in the last session we had a while ago, we had a whole session on this subsidy policy, and really it's so full of holes and issues and problems that it's so difficult you know, to think of, that someone conceptualized this without really talking to the industry, looking at the long term implications, thinking through the implications, consequences of this. Uh, but we raise a lot of issues around that. But it's, it's the same thing, you know, uh, things are being developed at the moment without proper consultation, without proper inputs. And these contracts are the same. The issues around the Mamalari contract, I'm glad that Jack showed that table of the research to be produced around those five bidders. It speaks to a, a poorly designed contract. And it's not in our interest as an industry, nor in the government's interest that you have such wide variations and, and, and bid, bids. Technology is giving us lots of excitement today. From <laughs> Jackie at this moment. Um, but ladies and gents, yes, let's, uh, Jack, Prof. Jackie will obviously join us again. We're still continuing. Uh, let's give a big hand to the great uh, panelists we have this far. Thank you very much so far. Please do not disappear. We hope that you can stay online. Uh, we're going to have, take a, a short lunch break. We will be back here at one o'clock. Um, I'll put up a clock, uh, uh, Neil Smith and myself just going to do some quick screen sharing and so on, and I'll put up a, a clock so that you can see 
you know, when we're going to uh, commence with the session again, there will be two presentations this afternoon from Tommy Sneeman and Neil Smith, and, uh, and then a short panel discussion again, and obviously again some prize giving from from Huawei. So thank you very much this far. We will see you guys again at one o'clock, and thank you to our panelists again. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Neil, you're welcome to do some screen sharing. Okay, so can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, let me just see if this works. Because I've never done it before. I did that. Uh, so what do I click on to get the presentation? So that's my presentation. Okay, are you, are you on a Mac or on a PC? I'm on a Mac. So can you see that? No. Uh, no, I can't see anything. Okay. That didn't work. So I click share. There, there we go. There we go. And I can see your desktop. And, uh, <laughs> ah, some secrets on the desktop. There are. There are. But wait a minute. My presentation disappeared. That's why I'm doing this, because they always disappear. <laughs> uh, just hold on. Looking forward to see you in your July, Neil. Where's that? Is that on your screen? No. Nope. You can see this. You can go to slideshow mode now, then it's perfect. Uh, so where is that slideshow mode? Where is that? Yeah, bottom right. Are you almost there. Or you can go to slideshow and go to first slide. That should also do the trick. Play from start to the left. Play from start to the left. Play from if, start. Yeah, play from start. Perfect. Is that it? That's it. it. Go from page to page. What do I do? Uh, the little arrow at the bottom. Page down or page up. There we go. Okay. Okay. All right. Lots of pictures. The pictures come up. Okay. Yes. Now, I'm very conscious that I'm the last speaker after lunch on a pretty boring topic. So I will do my best to make this interesting. Well, I'm quite sure you'll be successful. So that's my job, isn't it, isn't it David? <laughs> it is. I, where's that dollar sign um, one you usually use? I'm going to talk about that one, David. Oh, yeah. Harry, they used to use me in Australia to do the first paper after lunch in conferences. So that was, that was my core skill. So <laughs> let, yeah, but, but your best presentation was one slide and it only had a dollar on it. I loved it. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that one. I'm going to talk about that All one. All right. Yeah, I've got. I've kept that. It's a treasure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that works, but it probably won't at the time, Harry. But let's be patient with each other. So that's good. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you guys just now.
Okay, colleagues, let's start moving back to our workstations. Uh, we're about to start again with our afternoon session. Um, we've got two very exciting presentations ahead of us. So let's take up our seats. <clears throat> All right, so we start talking improving public transport international best practices, the 3rd of June 2021. Um, and uh, we've got two presentations. The first one here, Mr. Tommy Sneiman, is the intelligent transport systems industry expert to Huawei Enterprises of Africa. And Mr. Neil Smith is international public transport specialist. He's also going to present from the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, they did two panelists, and then we'll have a panel discussion where we can ask questions. Um, so the first presenter then, Mr. Tommy Sneiman. Tommy, thank you very much. Tommy is going to talk to us about interoperability in the transport sector, international best practices. Thank you, Tommy. Share my screen. Okay, ready? See my screen? Thank you, Tommy. Perfect. Just want to if the bandwidth is going down, then, then I can uh, shut down my video. So thank you for the, for the opportunity that we can also present today. I think it's a very important topic. I've been involved in public transport. And very interesting when Prof. Jackie was talking about uh, contract management and subsidies. The first time I met Prof. Jackie was in, in court, uh, in the Supreme Court in Victoria, when I was representing or assisting Gauteng provincial government. And he was uh, helping on the Sabawa side. So it was very interesting and where we're coming from. Still the same issues. But... Uh, Unfortunately, there is certain things that we need to, to change and we need to do certain things to go forward. So therefore, from my side, very important that we are looking at uh, how technology, technology can assist in improvement. So from my slides today, first of all, we can just look at the Huawei overview. Then on interoperability definitions, it's important to go back to theory. And then smart transportation, what is smart trans uh, transportation? Jack mentioned a few things, Basil mentioned a few things. And then the infrastructure strategy that's required. And then lastly, it's a digital platform that we need to look at to move forward to get uh, interoperability. So first of all, um, Huawei, who's Huawei? Huawei is a global technology company with more than 194,000 employees and working in more than 170 countries. Uh, now, for Huawei, research and development is very critical because so that is where we start in thinking about new ideas. And therefore, we have 14 R&D institutions and laboratories, uh, as well as innovation centers, of which one of them are located in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, most people think when they hear the name of Huawei, that is about mobile devices. Uh, the gifts that we're giving away today, that is... Uh, part of uh, mobile devices that we provide. And then we say, well, mobile devices are just a small portion of the total spectrum that Huawei provides. Now, Huawei has four business units. Just remember that, four business units. The carrier business unit, the consumer business unit, that is where all the mobile devices in, uh, are in. The enterprise business unit, that is where I'm working in. And then lastly, our new business unit, which is the cloud business. Everybody is moving towards cloud, and uh, cloud business is a separate business unit within Huawei. So when we have Huawei, well, we have seven, uh, several reference sites in more than 40 countries and in five continents. Uh, Huawei is experienced in all different transport modes globally. The topic for today is public transport. That includes three of our five uh, types of transport to all we focus on. We are involved in urban rail in several countries. 
We are involved in several smart airport aviation projects uh, globally, and we are involved in uh, various city roads, smart highway projects. From the information provided in the slide, you can see that uh, the names of the projects mentioned here is not limited to China. Everybody thinks that we are just operating in China. That is not limited to China, but global projects uh, and in public transport and for public transport operators. I use this slide to start my presentation today because I, for me, it's important. Um, I'm enjoying business and I'm also enjoying technology. Uh, when we start talking about technology, it's always very difficult to explain to non-technical people that why technology plays such an important role in achieving the end goal in mind. Uh, how do we get to achieve the key success factors that we are looking at? How do we get to the project objectives? and ultimate the, the, end, the state goal. Uh, for, to get to interoperability in public transport, you require uh, four key enabling components. You require the resources, the, the organ organizational structure. You require policies. You require certain business processes. And then you require smart systems and technology. Now, smart systems and technology is the foundation and the enable of smart transport becomes that uh, it's very important that the technology is correct. And I know that the other speakers today are talking about public transport principles and contracts, et cetera, but where my focus will be more on a technology based practice required to achieve interoperability in the public transport sector. Now, seeing that we've got some academics uh, in the audience today, I think it's important that we just look at, uh, at what is what is the difference between integration and interoperability. Uh, so let's first stop and let's see what is the definition. Sometimes when you're talking to people, the words integration and interoperability is loosely used and incorrectly quoted. The main difference between integration and interoperability is First of all, integration refers to the combination of multiple applications together as one uninterrupted system. So I want to focus multiple applications together as one uninterrupted system, where interoperability refers to ability of ICT or ITS based systems uh, to provide services such like data, information and control commands to other systems and to accept services from those other systems so that the interconnected systems can operate effectively together. Systems are inoperable when the ICT or the IT services are seamless provided in real time, including between different organizations and or different locations. And that is a source from PIOC. When we look at the convenience of traveling, when we talked about transport and Huawei has all the expertise to contribute within the smart transport system. In South Africa, we refer to integrated rapid public transport networks, IRPTNs, or IPTNs with auto rapid, uh, as that is still a dream you would like to achieve in public transport in South Africa. Previous speakers mentioned uh, a couple of these things, uh, Jack mentioned. Our previous Minister of Transport in Gauteng had a dream one ticket for all. And Jack was actively involved in that one ticket for all pro, uh, project. It's also interoperability in a public transport system. And I think from the Gauteng Transport Authority, they got a requirement or a, a goal to achieve to have one ticket for all. In other words, interoperability refers to the basic ability of different computerized products, systems, or technology to readily connect and exchange information with one another in either implementation or access without restrictions. So ICT or intelligent transport systems interoperability is particularly important for integrated rapid public transport networks and has relevance for the road user and the road network operator. For a service to be interoperable, there's three levels of interoperability that must be addressed. The first one is the technical interoperability which is the capability of the technical subsystems to communicate with each other by using standardized interfaces and communication protocols. Basil mentioned about protocols and standards in his presentation. 
the second one is procedural interoperability. Now, procedural interoperability is achieved when common procedures are used by all involved road network operators and by the users and the stakeholders. And I want to make an example here, for instance, every municipality has got its own fair policy. Uh, every operator has got his own fair policy. And we need to look at that. How do we have a common fair policy within, like in Gauteng, uh, to make this interoperability possible? Contractual interoperability is a third one that requires agreements between network operators about service levels, financial transactions, data security, enforcement, and the assignment of roles and responsibilities. Therefore, I'd like to mention a few examples of new trends in industry which will assist the commuter to make a more informed travel decision and improve on the experience of a journey on public transport. First one uh, that came forth in some presentation already today is the automated fare collection system. The latest trends on interoperability was to move away from the bank issued fare media system and adopt a new technology. This technology is defined as account-based ticketing, ABT. Account-based ticketing is a ticketless, ticketless way of allowing people to traveling, travel, meaning they tap or scan using a uh, secure token linked to an account in the back office. The account-based ticketing moves from the card-centric to a back office-centric operation. By moving to a token-based or bring your own ticket, it will provide a single platform with interoperability between all the different subscribed public transport operators in South Africa. Smart bus. Smart bus technology not only provides information to the commuter, but also communicate critical vehicle and driver data to the control center through the normal mobile platforms. Here we refer to the advanced public transport management system, passenger counters, driver behavior and monitoring equipment and video surveillance. The third one, which is very new, is the smart lamp pole. Although we refer to it as a smart lamp pole, we are also providing the platform for prov providing a real-time public transport travel information on the pole. We provide a communication platform to calling the command center during emergencies through push to talk facilities and real-time surveillance. Throughout the transport industry, there is three key outcomes that all stakeholders want to achieve through technology, processes, policies, and people. This is to provide a safe and efficient journey for the commuter, which contribute to the experience they will, will receive during the journey. Unfortunately, the experience commuters have about public transport in several countries is not on the same standard, and there is a limited choice of transport type they can select. But to get to the point that transport modes become seamless or interoperable, we require innovative technologies such as big data, artificial intelligence, video surveillance platforms, the Internet of Things or IoT, cloud computing, and mobility. Until a decade ago, public transport was operating in silos. More and more have moved to the technology driven transport system. The complexity of any information system is based on the gathering and the fusion of data, followed by its analysis and dissemination of information. It will depend on a number of data sources, data users, and a variety of different types of data that exists. The system will need to accommodate interfaces to existing systems and multiple stakeholders, as would normally be expected in data integration projects of this nature. When we follow an open ecosystem principle, we see that connectivity makes digital transformation possible. Using data is obviously essential in transport management because cities want to understand what causes, for instance, traffic congestions, how they can improve mobility by understanding traffic flow and understanding the habits and the behaviors of drivers. But what does it mean that you have connectivity between all the different data sources? but no computing power. The seamless convergence or interoperability between multiple transport modes, as we have in Gauteng, South Africa, or any other metropolitan city, requires two major ICT principles. We need connectivity, first of all, 
and then we need computing power and processors. Cities and provinces want real-time transport data from cameras, speed sensors, and other technologies to flow into a transport management center. We process and then weigh up potential actions based on the outcome of the analysis. As the transport demand increases, the need for seamless transition between systems becomes more important. The need for integration is particularly acute in situations where there are complex public transport in the cities and also in provinces. The demand for reliable real-time public transport and other transport information systems continues to grow. The old school of each operator to have their own closed system and not to be able to integrate with other entities is obsolete. We are working and migrating towards an open ecosystem. To build a digital platform, there is a connectivity required from the devices, which is IoT devices, or other sensors within the public transport vehicles to a computing platform consisting of data and utilized by artificial intelligent platform. Now, I just want to stop on that by saying that if we had this type of data and for a contract like uh, that was explained today, uh, the kilometers that was different between all the different tenderers, that wouldn't have been a problem because by from technology IT devices, that would have been uh, accurate information provided to all the tenderers. So effective and efficient public transport not only depend on technology that's been used in the system. It is about how you implement and use the technology to improve the journey and assist with the operations of the transport operator and entities. Traditionally, we had a personal computer linked to a server and we store data received from the information that was processed and it was more on historical data obtained from several uh, activities performed. Now, we have public transport vehicles moving on road, rail and air that generate much more valuable data and information that can be used to improve decision making and planning in the sector. Every vehicle, train and plane are now equipped with IoT devices that transmit data through various types of technology such as microwave, optic fiber, Wi-Fi and or public or private GSM networks through the data centers. Data centers have now changed drastically in form factors, which is not only safe on space, but also reduced the amount of energy required. More and more institutions move away from owning their own data centers and use the services of cloud facilities and service providers to host their data. It is no longer the responsibility of institutions to be concerned about data space and the upgrade of data centers and facilities. Intermodal transport requires a digital base to collect and communicate the data to the industry platform consisting of the cloud computing platform, uh, the big data platform, the IoT platform, as well as the video surveillance system. This is the core requirements to provide the digital world to have full visibility and collaboration in the intelligent operation center. The future of public transportation is smart based on scenarios and innovation. The underlying infrastructures such as networks and data centers are used as a foundation. In the middle, the transportation digital platform implements unified big data convergence analysts, IoT devices, video management, GIS, and converged communication. After integrating these basic elements, AI is used to enable openness. Various applications that can be continuously developed are constructed at the upper layer, such as the situation presentation, analysis and decision making, event management and control, monitoring and warning and emergency response. In general, the traffic brain of the city will be implement coordination and control of urban transport resources. If you look at new technologies that are affecting the transport industry, then we see there's four innovations in the transport that the transport industry require. First off, all is the operational innovation. Uh, that is the provision of Wi-Fi, the provision of 5G technology, 
Uh, the next one is the technology innovation, which is the Internet of Vehicles and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, the third one is the mode innovation, that is transit oriented development and multimodal transport. And the last one is service innovation, that comes to trip sharing and travel forecast and guidance. The most important for us moving forward, and I think for Gating, the most important to, to, to be established to have interoperability in the public transport is to establish the IOC. Uh, Intelligence Operations Center. The main purpose of the IOC is three-folded and for other industries similar to transport industry like the smart city. First of all, it provides a single platform for the consolidation of all the information collected from various data sources. The data sources range from single departmental, third party stakeholders, municipal databases, or individual roadside devices sending information to database platforms. In the past, all these data sources were isolated and standalone. The IOC creates a platform for the consolidation of data into the single platform required to assist with two additional purposes. The second purpose is to provide a platform for command and control. The IOC and the consolidating platform makes it easier to monitor all the activities in the transport sector. The command and control provide the platform for several management levels to access the information and make informed decisions to the benefits of all stakeholders. The stakeholders are not limited to government, but also to the most important stakeholder, the consumer or the road user. It is more and more important that the consumer of the road user, typical road users, which includes the pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, vehicle passengers, and passengers of on road public transport like buses and trams. Trip planning and access to information becomes more critical, which can only be provided if a total integrated or inoperable platform is established in the IOC. The dissemination of information through mobile applications or variable message signs contribute to the smooth and the planned origin destination trip. The information is not limited to vehicle transport, but also to non-motorized transport. Now, if you look at video, video plays a, a critical role, role, and I think this mentioned already that in Cape Town, they're sitting with problems of what's happening on buses. Now, if you look at a combination of edge and cloud CCTV, it becomes very important in the transport industry. In public transport to assist with safety and security, both edge and cloud surveillance have an important role to play. Uh, edge computing is used to process time sensitivity data, sensitivity data, while cloud computing is used to process data that is not time driven. Besides latency, Edge computing is preferred over cloud computing in remote locations where there is limited or no connectivity to a centralized location. It's important to understand that we are we moving with, with cameras, for instance, um, while we have a range of software defined cameras. All the video are captured on the camera. You don't have to send it immediately to, to the back office or to the transport management center. Uh, there's algorithms built onto the, the cameras. That's why we call it software defined cameras. And the cameras is self learning and they learned certain things that is happening in a week, on a weekly, uh, weekly basis. That includes automated number plate recognition, uh, face recognition, human recognition. And there's a lot of, uh, I think it's about 48 different algorithms built into, into the cameras. The next point is the Internet of Things. That's a buzzword, but I think there's a lot of work that's already been done on IOTs. IOTs is driving the integration of digital and physical worlds and causing customers' demand to shift from products to services, meaning production is now determined by consumers, not by producers. Integral to such developments are ICT systems, which are transforming from support systems to production systems. The IoT is an enormous and a complex ecosystem that requires the joint efforts 
and close collaboration of ICT solution providers, enterprises, research institutions, and governments. Huawei has, with partners, been developing excellent IT solutions that promote the industry ecosystem and drive innovation. The Huawei's Cloud Core Network has developed a unified IoT connection management platform that is access agnostic, carrier class, scalable, and open. The platform provides full connections amongst people and things. It supports the fast integration of multiple vertical industries applications and offers APIs to meet diverse uh, devices access needs, helping carriers, enterprises, uh, and industries built end-to-end IoT solutions and to quickly integrate multiple industries, applications, and increase business revenues. The open APIs help customers quickly integrate industry devices, accelerate services rollout, and reduce integration cost. The last point I want to, to talk about is artificial intelligence. That's a buzzword that is going around, but what what does it help for transport? Artificial intelligence is already having a profound impact on the way we interact with the world around us. As a powerful set, or powerful set of technologies that can help humans solve everyday pro uh, problems, AI significantly applications in several fields. One such field is transport, where AI applications are already disrupting the way we move people and goods. From scanning traffic patterns to reduce road accidents and optimizing sailing, sailing routes to minimize emissions, AI is creating opportunities to make transport safer, more reliable, more efficient, and cleaner. There are multiple applications of AI in both advanced economies and emergency markets that exemplify the contributions these evolving technologies can make to economies. AI holds the promise of dramatically increased productivity and efficiency in several sectors, including transport. And these changes are not in the same distant, distant future. They are happening right now. AI is already helping to make transport safer, more reliable and efficient, and cleaner. Some applications include drones for quick life-saving medical deliveries in Sub-Saharan Africa. In conclusion, the digital world and a platform will enable public transport to move to the next level of connected vehicles, connected government, and satisfied customers. Customers here, I refer to the commuter. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you so much, Tommy. This was seriously interesting, and thank you for all the comparisons and uh, sharing with us everything that Huawei is doing. Um, this is really impressive, and thank you so much. Um, I would love to hear your opinion about the fifth industrial revolution in the panel discussion, <laughs> as we all talk about the fourth industrial revolution, but uh, I would like to hear your opinion in the, in the panel discussion just now. Thank you so much, Tommy, and for your support. We really appreciate that. <clears throat> Ladies and gents, let me get our program up. Our last but definitely not least presenter this afternoon is Mr. Neil Smith. Smith is the International Public Transport Specialist. Um, we asked him a little more information about himself and he was kind enough to share, so I would love to, to introduce you to Neil. He says, I'm a non-executive director and major shareholder of Sealink Travel Group, SLK, Australia's largest passenger transport group listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. SLK is a market capitalization of 2.13 billion Australian dollars. Sealink operates contracted urban bus services in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Darwin, Perth, Singapore, and London, with a total fleet of 3,500 buses and 24 light rail vehicles. Sealink is also the largest marine passenger operator in Australia with 116 vessels. The group employs 8,900 staff. The bus business operates as transit systems and grew as a result of the competitive tender process, introduced gradually across Australia from 1995. Transit Systems is a long-term advocate of the value of effective tendering processes, but also a knowledgeable uh, critic of how these processes can fail. My focus has always been on operations, but I am a 
closet academic. I have taught occasional courses and lectured at the University of Sydney, the University of South Australia, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Outside of my business interest, I'm involved in the development of leadership training programs in the challenged parts of Africa with a focus on the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, the Sudan, and Sierra Leone. Pre-COVID, I was a regular traveler to visit and assess our projects. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, and Neil is going to talk to us about the importance of contract design to obtain, obtain good results. Thank you so much, Neil. Neil, you just muted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you, Neil. Do you have my screen or not? Did that work? Not, not yet, no. Not yet, not yet. I'm as technically challenged as anyone. Green, green share screen at the bottom of your screen. <laughs> it's never where you think it is. It was there before, wasn't it? <laughs> My apologies for this. Eh? My apologies. There's no right. This worked before. So why is it not working now? This is everybody's nightmare, isn't it? So, <laughs> no, share Russia. Screen, share screen, share. There we go. Now we can see your desktop. Can you see that? Slideshow. Yes, now slideshow and right. Yes, that's it. Are we right? Perfect. Thank you, Neil. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I realize this is the last session on our, today, and I will do my best to keep everyone awake and interested as we move through. Uh, I'm an Australian. I live in the United Kingdom. I'm an operator, which means that my perspective is going to be that of a private sector participant in the operation of bus services. And I'm a pragmatist. I'm interested in what works. So in looking at contract design, I want everyone just to sit back and imagine someone has given you a new job. And starting Monday, you have to design a bus operating contract for the region where you live. So where do you start? Do you read the national infrastructure plan? Do you look at the contract that was there before? Do you look at the person next door? I wanna suggest you start somewhere completely different in thinking about a contract. Your first job is to hire a helicopter and take your helicopter above the area where you want to design a bus contract for and look at that region and gain an understanding in your mind of where people live and work and study and get healthcare of how they move around. I want you to start with the helicopter trip so that every day as you design a contract, you ask yourself the question, given our budget, how can this contract make this community a better place to live? It's when the contracting process becomes an end in itself, rather than a way of improving society, that things fall over. The second question, 
you need to, to do is you need to understand the market. Maybe not the bazaar in Afghanistan, but when an authority decides to contract out public transport services, the authority is plunging into the market. Now, I know very well that a lot of those who work in the public sector are uncomfortable with the market because in government, you give instructions. In government, you pass laws. In government, you regulate. But the market has a power of its own. You have to think of the market like a great volume of water coming down the side of a hill. You can't stop market forces, but you can channel them. You can put them in irrigation channels that lead to benefits. And the contract that governs the operation of a public transport system is a mechanism that enables government to channel market forces in a constructive way. So you need to understand the market to understand what the contract is trying to perform. And everybody who is in a market, unfortunately, is in there for money. The government goes to market because they want the most efficient solution. The operator goes to market because they want a profitable business. So the contract is trying to reconcile these desires for all parties to maximize financial benefit in a way that serves the community. I was once asked at a Threadbow conference to explain what motivates a private bus operator. It, it's a formal conference, lots of people sitting there, moderator, people on chairs at the front. I had 20 minutes to speak and I put up one slide and my slide had a dollar sign on it. And then I sat down and it caused some outrage in the audience because they said it can't be that simplistic. But actually at one level, the market is simplistic. It's participants exchanging goods and services and capital for their financial benefit. And if you don't understand that, contracting will always come off the tracks. So I've come up with some principles to help those both on government side and the private sector side navigate this attempt to reconcile market forces and community needs. Now I've used the dictic. I did a camping trip in Zimbabwe with my children many years ago. Two of my children decided the dick dick was their favorite animal. The third one decided that the warthog was her favorite animal. She later became a politician. Maybe I should have read the signs. So what are my dick dick principles? Okay. I wanna talk about how you define a contract, how you incentivize participants about key performance indicators, how you de-risk contracts. I want to talk about indexation. And most importantly, I want to talk about good karma. I think we've heard very clearly already today that a contractual process is basically useless unless the authority gives a clear and comprehensive definition of what they want. That definition of the service that's required is taken by an operator and used to create a detailed financial model. They borrow money against that model. They budget against that model. If the contract doesn't tell the operator what's required, the operator will get it wrong. I've seen many examples of contracts that had inaccurate timetables, inaccurate service levels, had vague expectations like you should train your staff, but no actual requirement for training. I've seen contracts that required vehicles 
that you couldn't buy in that market. I've seen contracts that required you to give the address of the depot you were going to use if you won the contract, which of course you didn't own or rent until you'd won the contract. These things are normal in poorly run contracting processes and they all have one simple effect. They put the cost up for the authority. Every competent bidder will charge for risk. And I may say that two or three times, but never forget it. Every competent bidder will charge for risk. A contract should incentivize the operators. Now, many people say, don't incentivate the private sector. They're only in it for the money. The reality is whether you incentivize or punish in your contract model makes no difference to the price you receive. Again, a competent bidder will bid the benefits of incentives into their price and they will bid the cost of penalties into their price. But if you have incentives, you are creating a positive contractual relationship. If you have punishments, you are creating an adversarial contract relationship. And at the end of the day, often the private sector is better at adversarial than government because they stand to lose everything. The incentives are also critical in explaining to a bidder what is actually required, what the priorities are of the authority. So some authorities are obsessed by long on time running, some by patronage, some by uh, the cleanliness of the vehicles. If you're bidding and you're trying to work out what is required, clear incentives give a very, a very a positive idea of what the authority is after. Every contract has key performance indicators. And these indicators, again, send a very strong message to a bidder about what the authority actually wants. But there are two major problems with KPIs. They have to be objective and measurable, or they simply create conflict. And often these KPIs are not. To give a perfect example, customer satisfaction is often a subjective and vague measure. And customer satisfaction is simply the difference between what people expect and what they get. I've run contracts where customer satisfaction was high because the level of service was low and nobody expected much anyway. I've seen contracts where customer satisfaction is low, but the service level is very good, and so people have high expectations. The other problem with KPIs is they have to be simple. We have a contract in Australia that has 52 KPIs. So people have to manage that contract around 52 different measures. Now, remember that what happens in a bus company is not what management does. It's what the drivers do. They deliver. And most of our drivers have a high school education. Most of them speak English as a second language. Most of them want to do the right thing. But if you give a driver 52 KPIs to work to, he just throws it all in the bin. It's too hard. So KPIs have to be simple and limited. And we actually have one KPI in our business that overrides them all. We tell our drivers, if things are going wrong and you have no idea what to do, look after your passengers, full stop. You will never lose your job if you've made a decision to look after your passengers. Now risk, we've talked a lot about risk today. And I go back to the rule, a competent bidder is always going to charge for risk. So you have to be careful what risks you build in. 
Now, contractors should take risk. That's what they're offering government. If they're not willing to take a risk, they must doubt their own competence to do the job. But they have to be risks they have control over, and they can only take risks at a point in time. So things like maintaining and cleaning vehicles, getting a supply of fuel and parts and vehicles, industrial relations, dealing with the staff, managing the purchase of capital equipment, working with passengers to keep order, they're all things an operator can and should take risk on. Patronage is a little difficult because some of the effect of patronage is what the operator does and some of it is socioeconomic conditions. Service quality, again, there are a lot of measures of that. For example, congestion can damage service quality and the operator can do nothing about it. Service changes, a debate here, but a qualified contractor should be able to contribute to the evolution of a service. But contractors shouldn't take risk for changes in government decisions and legislation. And they can't take risk for changes that occur over time. And particularly the last one, which has brought many, many contracts undone, are congestion costs. Which brings me on to the idea that every contract must have a clear functioning indexation system. A contractor can bid at a point in time, but they can't predict the future. And when a government puts or designs a contract that doesn't have a clear, transparent, effective indexation system, they're making a decision that they don't want a professional bus operator, they want a clairvoyant, they want a profit. Now, I can assure you, if I knew what the price of fuel was going to be in two years, I wouldn't be running buses. I'd be playing the market. If I knew what was going to happen to exchange rates, I wouldn't be running buses. You can't put those risks on a contractor unless you want to pay the price. I can give a good example. We have a contract in Australia where one element of our cost structure was the interest rate we would have to pay on purchasing a bus. The, the authority said, you have to fill the box in. We said, we don't want to fill the box in because we, can't, we don't know what it will be. We will accept an index. The authority said, you must fill the, fill the box in. Well, we did. And then interest rates dropped by two thirds. And in that contract, we made more money out of buying buses than we ever made out of operating buses because we had to take a guess on something we had absolutely no control over. In most of our contracts, it seems to work that if you index fuel and oil to a regional wholesale diesel price and adjust it every month, and you index wages to a regional index of employment types, and you use the CPI for the balance, that normally works. Of course, if your cost structure is highly dependent on foreign exchange, that can bring these undone. And the final one of the principles is karma. A transport contract is a long-term relationship between very different participants. The Transit Authority is a public sector, community-focused, politically accountable organisation. The contract there is a private sector, profit-motivated, financially accountable organisation. The contract has to bring those two groups of people together so that both benefit and that their focus is on community benefit. Now that requires trust, particularly trust. We have a list of untrustworthy transit authorities because we won't work with them because of dishonesty, because of uh, unilateral breach of contracts terms. 
It needs honesty. It needs very clear communication. It needs realism. As was mentioned earlier, sometimes conditions change and it needs some tolerance. And it needs those from both sides. Don't think I'm saying this is a list of government faults. Private sector operators fail on all of these every bit as much as government. But if you can build a partnership, if your contract builds a partnership like that, then together two very different organisations can maximise efficiency and maximise community benefit to move forward. Using contracts has delivered incredibly positive outcomes in the transport industry around the world. Uh, an earlier presenter showed the difference between subsidies in Germany and Italy. And that figure of a 20 to 25% saving continually comes up when you compare a transport system that is subject to a competitive process and one isn't. And in London, in Singapore, in Perth, for us in some Adelaide contracts, there've been very, very good response, uh, outcomes for the public, for the government and for the operator. On the other hand, there's a long list of contracting exercises that have failed. And you can look at those failures and see why they failed. So the dictic principles are there to preserve all parties in developing a contract from the mistakes that lead either to a bad outcome for government or a bad outcome for the contractor or a bad outcome for the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Clearly you're talking about where the tech eats the tar. <laughs> Lots of experience and we really appreciate your wisdom sharing with us. Um, and uh, would you kindly stay online and would you switch to on so that we can start with the panel discussion? If we can start, uh, we'll ask the other um, uh, panelists, also those of the morning who's willing to partake in a panel discussion to switch on your video and unmute yourself. Then I can see who want to be part of the panel discussion. I can bring you in. But before we're going to do this, we're going to have some fun again. Um, and uh, it's Huawei again, who's going to sponsor uh, uh, gifts. And Tommy, um, you over to you. Oh, thank you, Harry. I think I posted the question already. Those three people who yeah. have one already, two already, that's like done. <laughs> thank you. That was very quickly. I put so many emphasis on this question. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for everybody contributing to it. So, but, uh, Congratulations to the winners. That was, that was big. <laughs> yes, 100%. Thank you very much. I, they were definitely listening to you very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Harry. Thank you. Let's just bring the panelists in. Um, Tom, you're going to also to partake in this panel discussion? Yes, that's great. So, so uh, just give me uh, a moment, guys. I'm going to bring you all in. All right, am I missing someone? Uh, what happened to my friend Tommy now? Let me just find Tommy. Seems to me Tommy has maybe he's got some technical problems, so Tommy will join us just now. But there he is, there he is, there he is. Tommy, there you are. There we go. All right, ladies and gents, you're welcome to, to unmute yourself and ask questions to the panelists. Uh, you can raise your hands in the, pen, in, in the, in the participants' box or you can unmute yourself and I will recognize you and you can ask questions. The guys on YouTube, you're also welcome to, to test questions. I see there are quite a number of guys on YouTube. 
Um, Tommy, maybe we can start with the question that I asked you earlier on about how do you see the fifth industrial revolution um, in, in comparison of the fourth industrial revolution? Uh, that's a topic I find very interesting. Maybe you can elaborate on that. I think we battled to do fourth industrial revolution. And uh, we had this, this discussion already over breakfast. So I think you, um, that's very difficult to say, but bringing in the person into machine language, bringing in the person to make certain things. And because well, if you look at the fourth industrial revolution and artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is all about getting a machine to learn like a person and like, like people. And I think um, putting emotion into, into the equation becomes very important. But I think there's a lot of water that needs into, into the sea before we get to that point. Uh, maybe later on in the year, we, we must have a discussion on that separately, just on technology side. So let's first get fourth industrial revolution resolved in transport sector. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> Prof. Hensha, I see you, you've made a comment for Neil Smith. Uh, maybe, Prof, if you can elaborate on your question. Yeah, I actually had a, another question that I'd prefer to ask, but uh, I'll do that first because um, I have a technology question I'd like to get some feedback on. But uh, um, I, I guess the issue that's really important because Neil talked a lot about risk and he's absolutely right. And I think we're moving into a, an era, certainly in Australia and Europe, and I'll come back to this zero emission buses yet again, where there's going to be a growing uncertainty about through bidding as to what price one would put on a, a whole range of components that you'd normally include in the bid price. And they clearly do involve the maintenance of the depot, the the refurbishment of the depot to allow for the new a charging capability. What, what sort of buses should you order? Um, should they be electric, uh, uh, battery or fuel cell? Um, uh, is there a risk that you could end up with some stranded assets here? And then if you have to replace your diesel buses earlier than you normally would, how do you factor that cost into the... Uh, the, the bid price. And I think we're going to find that the idea of a Dutch auction is going to be extremely complicated. What I mean by that is um, a bidding process whereby um, many of the cost items are pretty well known and there are slight variations amongst the bidders. In this case, it's not going to be like that. Neil said in earlier that he's, he's not got no problem in working with Green, green fuel, and I don't either, but uh, as an expert in, in writing tenders, what assumptions will he have to make about the risk sharing between him and the government in order to be happy that he's not, he's not coming up with a ridiculous price? Maybe, maybe if I could answer, start off with that. I think the biggest uncertainty is the price of electricity. <laughs> Because whereas the price of fuel is not a difficult, of diesel is not an easy, a difficult thing to measure and to build an index around, uh, electricity jumps by the second if you've got a deregulated market. And once you've got a bus depot with 250 buses in it, you've actually got almost a, a, an electric ecosystem where you're not only running buses, but you may be sucking power in the, off the grid when it's cheap and pumping power back into the grid when it's more expensive. I mean, one of, one of our views in the business is that we will need expertise in the trading of electricity. Um, we're looking at another product at present that uses surplus electricity to mine cryptocurrencies for an ethical cryptocurrency supplier. Um, and who would have thought a bus operator would need expertise in mining cryptocurrencies to be competitive? 
but we may have to be to be competitive. And I think what I, I don't think the issues of electrification upend the model, but I think it puts a whole new set of demands on, on bidders for contracts. And we've gone through a painful internal process to accept that electrification is real. And we only went through it as an Australian company because we had a European branch. And so we were two or three years ahead of Australia. So we now feel we do have good expertise in hydrogen because we've run hydrogen buses for seven years and good expertise in electrification. We also believe very, very strongly that for the private sector to have a role, it has to offer government something. You know, we're not entitled. So we have an R&D division and it's our aim to know more about electric buses, more about power generation, more about hydrogen than our government clients so that we can go to them and say, well, this is the range of things you can do. This is what it's going to cost. And this is how you should design a contract. Now that's all right for us, but we began with 40 buses and I don't know how someone begins with 40 buses now because the, the range of expertise you need to actively participate in an electrified bus system is a number of degrees higher than it was when you bought a diesel bus off your Volvo dealer and ran it down the road. So I, I think we can adjust. I think we have a role. I mean, we exist to help government. And I think there will always be mess in public transport systems and governments will always pay us to clean up the mess. And the mess might change, the role will remain. Could I just add something? I, I totally agree with Neil about the future of electrification, but I think what he's just demonstrated to us, that there's a risk that there'll be so few bidders that we'll have a similar situation we've had in some countries where we've had uh, one bidder or two bidders, and this, this has a cost inflationary impact. And if you're going to go that route initially, with the expertise that companies like Neil's had, wh why aren't we doing some sort of deal that's a transition one in taking advantage of that knowledge through a negotiated process where they're willing to share it? Because if you have to go through a bidding process, they may be less interested in sharing that knowledge. Well, we're not very interested in sharing it. That's what I thought. <laughs> Cost us a lot you, of money. You, Cost us a lot of you, money to get where we are. You just told me you're a good community citizen and want to work with government on this. <laughs> Think of the dollar sign, David. I know, I know. I can read. I can read between the lines here. This is a really interesting discussion, and it it does show you that risk has got a lot to do with where the expertise lies, and you want to try and share it if you can in a in a period of great uncertainty. And I'm not sure that putting it out to open market tender is going to necessarily produce the right outcome until uh, there's much more knowledge sharing of that. So it's not merely a, a matter of looking at the cost to deliver, adding on cost of sales and adding on 30% risk. Um, it's more scientific than that. <laughs> but that's, how, <laughs> that's the way people work <laughs> sometimes. Harry? I think, I think what's interesting about this debate is that you need, in my view, uh, like a mature market to deal with this, like, like Neil's mentioning, you know, maybe the Australian and the European market and the English market, you know, compared to a developing country's market, you know, there's a huge, there's a huge discrepancy there. And I mean, he's mentioned uh, the, um, the cost of electricity. You know, in South Africa, we also have the availability of electricity. That's a huge issue. And for, for many years to come, you know, we're going to have a massive shortfall in electricity. So I guess also that I think hydrogen, hydrogen fuel buses is something we should consider. You know, uh, it was mentioned earlier on today as well. But certainly it's, it's not plain straightforward. It's not the normal process of procurement in running and in, in, in requesting bids for electric buses and to run electric buses in the country. You have to rethink the whole scheme. As David mentioned, what do you do with old buses? 
that, that you're phasing out, you know, um, over say five, six, seven years or whatever the, the, the period is. And uh, how do you fund these buses? What's the duration of those contracts going forward? You know, who owns those assets? The operator or the authority? Does the operator only operate on behalf of the authority? And then you have all these other issues around infrastructure, the depots and so on. So it's, it's, I think in South Africa, we still have a long way to go uh, nailing all these unknowns. And people like Neil have such experience, you know, maybe the government should try and get him as a consultant to assist around these things. They want to really move fast on electric buses, hydrogen buses, and so on. Thank you, Prof. Jackie. Um, guys, let's give a last chance for questions from, from the audience. Uh, I see YouTube is happy. Um, people are really happy. It seems to me you guys convinced them and everything you said. Could I ask another question, please, to, please, bro. to our, yes. our, our colleague? Um, one thing that I've been doing a lot of work on lately, uh, with, with all the new technology that we have with smart technology, autonomous cars, uh, et cetera, uh, and the way in which we can efficiently inform the, the road network about what's happening or inform us as to what's happening, that there's a fundamental issue, and electric cars, autonomous cars are still cars. And what we're doing is to make them even more attractive than they've ever been in addition to the safety aspect. So there is a huge risk here, unless we rethink the pricing of this, that we will, we will actually end up in a situation where we um, are going to do enormous damage to the more sustainable modes especially public transport. Electric cars, when they're scalable, and I suspect autonomous, are going to be, and we're talking about 30 years on, less expensive to purchase, less moving parts, less expensive to use with cleaner fuels. And so what's that going to mean about sustainable solutions? It could create serious congestion on the road, worse than we have now. I don't see the technology people giving any credit to that possibility. I think, uh, David, uh, we're still in uh, the infant stages of this and the development. And uh, if I look at from, from a hobby perspective, we're doing a lot of research within China. Um, everything is happening in, in laboratories and also using it in on the streets of, of China, because I think if I just look at the, the quality, and uh, I didn't want to mention uh, the, the control center that we have with Incension, for instance, where we monitor over a million cameras at, uh, in, in one control center, you will not stop at the intersection because why well, there's cameras that's monitoring it. So it all comes back on what level and maturity you are with technology uh, in the transport industry, and that will help moving forward. If that same concept, and I remember Harry facilitated the process once with the previous Minister of Transport, I think, on moving to towards autonomous vehicles and uh, connected vehicles. And I said, we're far, far away from that point because there's more important things that we need to look at. So I think, yes, it's a very valid point that you're making that we need to be very careful when we start looking at technology that we don't create certain problems going further on. Can I Thanks. make a comment there? Um, as a business, we are investing a lot of money in electrification and in hydrogen. We are investing a lot of money in technology that gives us real-time information, that monitors our equipment, that monitors our services. We're investing a lot of money in big data. We're not investing a penny in autonomous vehicles. We don't believe that's on the horizon. I'm a dinosaur, maybe, but that's the corporate decision we've made. No, if, if and when that happens, that has a serious implication on labour, uh, which is 60% of your costs, and you don't need it. I don't think they'll need me either. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fascinating. I'm... I, I guess the general point is that 
a car is a car is a car, and it's a very popular means of transportation. And what we're doing is actually making it even more attractive. And so I think that the, it comes back to uh, we need to rethink road pricing again. We can't get away from it, and politicians hate it. But I think it's going to be the only instrument that's not blunt to protect public transport going forward, no matter how much your services will improve, because the car is just, in many societies, so dominant. And what we're doing with the new technology is making it even more attractive at the current prices. I also think it's important to understand what is the, what was this first chicken or the egg. And there's two things that we need to look at here. It is uh, autonomous vehicle and connected vehicle. And the connected vehicle becomes more and more important because for when you yeah. look at the roadside equipment, uh, connecting to the roadside equipment and you actually connect vehicle to vehicle, that will help with your transport planning. It will help with information, collecting information. And it will also help uh, that you can reduce traffic congestion. So I think the, the two points that we need to, and a lot of that comes back to my presentation about interoperability and, and interconnect. Um, connected vehicle is completely different. So I think we need to put it in different phases. So a bus can be a connected vehicle, but it don't need to be autonomous vehicle. Tom, so, something went wrong with your sound there, I think. No, I heard you. I heard you. Okay. Yeah. Maybe mute. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to be labored. I don't want to be labored the point too much. But as you make through through in, improved connectivity, you reduce congestion. It will actually, under the current pricing model, here's me talking as an economist, attract even more people to use their cars back into the system because the travel times are better. So that's the yes. issue. That's the challenge. I agree. Excellent. Yeah, clearly, we need to, to look at the bigger picture. Maybe in the older days, you know, when they implemented, for example, the fuel levy, uh, it was based on a complete different industry than we have today, you know, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of systems and so on. So the fuel levy can't cater for all of that anymore. Uh, we need road funding and stuff like that and, and, and intelligent systems to, to keep the life going, uh, going around us. Um, <clears throat> So thinking about the world around us and the places we play, work, and so on, you know, that, that we, we're working from home nowadays. And, and I see certain metros are encouraging people to rather work from home and they stop. Um, so that's also putting a different uh, impact on, on traffic and so on. So we, change, we need to change our lives. We need to change the way we spend. We need to change the way we play. Um, and we need to play the, the way how we integrate and, and, and plan our transport. Um, yeah, but let me not say too much, then, then it will get very boring. Maybe we get to um, some closing remarks to our valued uh, panelists um, for this session. And I would love to, to start with Prof. Hensha, and then we go to Neil, and then we go to Basil. Then we go to Tommy, and then the last word for our host, for our host Prof. Jackie Walters. So we can start with Prof. David, please. Thank you, Harry. I mean, let, let me just congratulate the speakers. I think it's been a, a fantastic session. And normally when I'm on these late night sessions, I switch off after a while. But this one's been so good that I've, I've stayed the mile. So thank you for doing that. But, you know, you thank mentioned you. working from home, and I can't resist the temptation in the in a closing comment, because we've, we're doing some major projects in that space at the moment. And I see the working from home as the most positive unintended consequences of COVID, strange way of putting it, and the biggest transport policy lever we've had for many years. So what I mean by that is in Australia, and it's the evidence I'm using, which is also confirmed in many other countries, is that um, both employers and employees are supporting some amount of working from home to some extent. And in most occupations, we can expect one or two days, and that has a week, and that has huge implications on the performance of the network. And I think what, we've, what we're starting to do now in governments is that they need to rethink their strategic uh, models and their strategic transport plans to take that into account. And my, my view is that that will have a huge impact on the performance of our networks. And we are currently 
revising the Sydney strategic model to adjust the patterns of commuting and non-commuting activities according to the instance of working from home. So I might leave that with you, but what that's actually doing, it's making the car more attractive because for people who don't travel to work quite so often, they are now starting to find that the cost of parking and the inconvenience of a little bit of traffic in the, is much more tolerable than when they went to five days a week. Once again, that's having a negative impact on public transport in one sense, but where you have crowding on public transport, it's actually solving that problem. So I think it's a win-win potentially going forward for the transportation system. And I'm hoping that governments will find the right incentives to ensure that working from home continues and we don't return to the bad old days pre-COVID. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for staying up late with us and sharing your valuable knowledge. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thanks, sir. Uh, Neil, Neil, some closing remarks. Having um, listened to the whole day, I, I'm looking for something encouraging to say to Basil. Um, because I, I think he, he's a man in need of some encouragement um, in this environment. And look, one thing that happened in Australia that was actually very helpful was, and it's been alluded to before, but it was on the educational level, and it was uh, a requirement that anybody who held a bus contract had to have a certain amount of training in public transport, uh, in tendering, in marketing, in these areas. And I think it lifted an industry above where it had been before and helped people adapt. And I think it also helped government people to learn. I mean, what, what, I, what you see when you mention 24 years of little change is the most appalling disconnect between government and reality. And it's how do you reconnect people there? And it, it, it's just hard. It's hard to see beyond education being a fundamental but very long-term way of enabling the bus industry to be given the role and the resources it needs to keep South Africa moving and to keep it as a functioning, uh, a functioning community. Thank you so much, Neil. <clears throat> Appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us and clearly you know what you're talking about and uh, we really appreciate your time and your preparations. Thank you so much. Um, Basil. Yeah, thanks, Harry. And uh, yeah, thanks for that positive uh, sentiment there, Neil. Uh, two analogies. <laughs> One is the dinosaur. <laughs> we do have some dinosaurs in our infrastructure and in our midst and and People are pretty set in the old school ways of doing and handling public transport solutions that it eventually turns to become part of a problem. But uh, the other analogy I was going to, I was going to ask everybody on the panel and say, the elephant's not on the room, it's in the road. And we're trying to craft a strategy to get this elephant to sit up and start moving in, in a different direction. But I think uh, a lot of today stimulated we know what's wrong. We do have our very own unique challenges and I appreciate your input from across the globe. It says these are solutions, but uh, the gap in, and I, I think the way Jackie put it, we almost need to take a step back and find our own solution using international best practice, which we can't afford at this point to bring a plug and play, but uh, people in, in the sector that Thomas and Tommy plays in, where the inter, interoperability and the integration. There's so many solutions. Everybody says, I can integrate. I can get this to talk to that. I can bring you. If we get to a point where we've got a data set that can give us all a good base to make decisions, I think we'll have made progress. So... But I take what you say, Neil. Uh, one of the things we've not done, and is also a disconnect, is educate people. So there's a continuum of development and improvement. 
we uh, uh, a lot of the universities do very centric focused type approaches on their programs and uh, sometimes there's a combative approach uh, to owning a space in research and being the leader to come to a point but i think in our country collaboration will get us a lot further than trying to uh, you know individually come up with a solution that's going to then give you proprietary ownership and profitability. Uh, so yeah, we've got a lot of work to do, but uh, more sessions like this, more uh, intellectuals, more people like yourself sharing with us will also assist us. Thanks, Ari. Thank you, Basil. And everybody else. Yeah, thank you, Basil, for that wisdom. Really appreciate that. Tommy. Oh, thank you, Ari. And thank you to the other speakers. <clears throat> and I think one of the core things that came through every time uh, when the presentation was done from the other speakers, then the technology uh, part came up. And from a hobby side, I'd like to say that we want to be a partner in, in this whole journey in public transport in South Africa. And we can hold hands on the technology side. And we would like to be part. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Tommy. We believe that the hobby can definitely add lots of value to our lives and public transport, intelligent transport systems. We really appreciate your sponsorship. Thank you, Tommy. Um, Prof. Jackie, can you kindly do closing remarks and close the session for us? Thank you, Eric. Yes, I think it was an excellent question. Um, um, so many people stayed right today, and I think it's testament to the interest in this specific field. I think uh, when I, I remember and you all, at your slide at the Zebra Conference that you went, went up to the stage, you put a dollar sign up, you went to sit down. It was really hilarious. <laughs> but, it's, but, but that's what it's about, isn't it? it isn't, uh, it's about money for the government, what they're paying for the services, and money for the operator, what he is receiving in exchange for the services being rendered. And that balance is really very important. Um, you know, and, and as I've said, that we can have risk apportionment is a very key player or element in that whole relationship. But I think if we can achieve one thing in South Africa, and that is that uh, you know, governments and operators should not distrust each, distrust each other. It's not the us versus them thing. We're trying to render services for the broader community out there, and, and that's, that's where the win should be at the community level. The government and operators see eye to eye and the end of the services for the community. And I really like I really like to see this type of thing developing. At the moment, it's very much our, uh, us versus them system. And, and as I've said earlier on as well, um, there's a, there's a, there's actually a view in government that's anti big business. You know, it's you can see it all over the economy, and this is really this is really what's happening as far as this is concerned. But certainly, I'd like to thank every uh, every analyst. Everybody prepared something today, and you, Harry, for uh, for setting up the session for us. Um, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for the participation, and we look forward to the next session. Thank you, Harry. Thank you so much, Prof. Jackie, for your hosting the session and your support and mentorship. We really appreciate, it. ladies and gents. Let's give a big hand to our panelists, and we look forward to seeing you guys again next Thursday. Thank you, and, and take care. Thank you so much. <laughs>